Greeks who took the African culture, synthesized it, and produced Greek civilization. And then later, the Prophet Muhammad and with the Arabs coming into the Nile Valley, they synthesized the culture and produced Islam. We ask these African ancestors who as part of their legacy laid the foundations for Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and Greek civilization to be with us in a vision for the future. We ask those African ancestors pulled out of Africa, taken to the hells of North America, South America, the Caribbean, maintaining the spirit of African humanity in their hearts and in their minds, and who left us this enormous legacy of struggle. We ask those Africans who resisted enslavement in the villages of Africa, who resisted enslavement in the shores of Africa, who resisted enslavement in those forts and dungeons, who resisted enslavement in the holes of those ships, who resisted enslavement when they arrived on these shores in the New World. We ask these Africans who ran into the highlands of Northeast Brazil and established for 100 years the first free republic in the Americas, the Republic of Palmares, and their last great leader, Zumbi, whose spirit and sacrifice we ask these Africans who replicated the Brazilian experience and went into the highlands of Jamaica and became the maroon free communities. We ask these Africans who went into the backwoods of the Guyanas and Suriname and created free republic of the Suramaka and the Ajuka. We ask these Africans who went into the backwoods of Georgia and the swamps of Florida and moved with the Seminole Indians and resisted oppression. We ask these Africans who left us a legacy of struggle and resistance, the likes of which no one in the world has to be with us, to strengthen us and give us a vision for the future. We ask these Africans who created and laid for us a foundation of struggle and resistance that was passed on generation after generation, that was passed on to Harriet Tubman who fell away out of enslavement and became a symbol of freedom for all of us. Similarly, Frederick Douglass and hundreds of thousands of others fought their way out of enslavement. We ask those Africans who went with Bookman Dessalines to create the greatest revolutionary experience in the history of the world, the Haitian Revolution, leaving us a legacy, the likes of which no one else has had. We ask these Africans to be with us, to strengthen us. Thank you. Very, very pleasant morning to you. You are inside of the Africa Forum. It is running Africa. And good morning, good morning, good morning. Reuniting the African family for development is a vision of this program. Bearing witness, demanding change. Developing an African-centered agenda for change and development, even while we blaze new paths towards Africa's rendezvous with destiny. We're coming to you live from Liberty Hall, the legacy of Marcus Garvey, live from 76 King Street. My name is Kabu, Kabu Ma'at Keru, and this morning we have a very, very special program lined up for you because it is a very, very special day. You've been hearing the promos 1914 to 2014, 100 years of Garveyism. Uh, my co-host in this segment of the program, let me introduce her immediately, is Donna McFarlane. Hey, Donna. Thanks. Of course, Donna McFarlane is the curator and director of Liberty Hall. Morning, morning. Good morning, good morning. All right, the team is on the ground, uh, the outside broadcast team on the ground here at Liberty Hall. And don't know if you can hear, but outside in the distance or on the grounds of Liberty Hall, another team drumming, and they have been drumming since last night, we understand. Profi and the Naya Bingi drummers on the ground are drumming. Do you know what time they started, Donna? I have no idea. I'm so <laughs> pleased to see them this morning. But I... they were outside. Yes. Uh, uh, and they have been there for a while. So the production team is live on the ground. And um, my uh, producer this morning is Joy Morgan. And uh, with the co-producing is Nicholas Evans. Good morning, Nicholas. Good morning, Joy. Also uh, with us here, Romaine Gordon. Thank you. Well, uh, Romaine, welcome. <laughs> Welcome, our intern at IRFM, our engineer, our engineering team, uh, Ricky and uh, uh, Gwyn on the ground with us, Ricardo Powell uh, on the ground with us this morning. Also, Mark, let me just say welcome to you, Mark, for uh, joining us with the live stream. You can tell me, Mark, indicate if we are streaming live at the moment. All right, so let me welcome our listeners on the internet at irfm.net. We are streaming live at the moment. Welcome to you on the 107s, 107.1, all the way to 107.9. And for the live stream, 
www.irefm.net. 100 years since the formation of the UNIA and ACL, the Universal Negro Improvement Association and the African Communities League. Well, we have been telling you about uh, the program for this morning. Let me just say welcome to our panelists who are coming in, Stephen Golding, Amina Blackwood Meeks, and many more to come. Akuja Seneb, Life, Prosperity, and Health to you. Uh, our, one of our panelists was very, very early this morning, and he said to me, you know, if I had to come to Ocherias, I would have been earlier, but he was still very, very early. <laughs> Good morning to you, Mr. Bird Samuels. Dr. Arthur Green is also on the ground uh, as one of our panelists, and so too Dr. Imani Tafari. As our panelists continue to come in. But Donna, we're broadcasting here from Liberty Hall, and let us start with a little bit about that. Tell us a little bit about Liberty Hall. When well, this building uh, was built by Garvey in 1933, and on this site was a Liberty Hall from 1923, and it was the headquarters of the Kingston Division of the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League, what we call the UNIA. So when Garvey was deported back to Jamaica, he was actually brought right here to this site. It's the only building like it on King Street in that it's set back from the road where he has a space in the front, a garden, and I believe that he had his public meetings in that garden mm -hmm. without having to ask the authorities for permission to have it in the street. This building was for a long time uh, in a derelict condition. It was purchased by the government in 1987 to celebrate the centennial of Garvey's birth. And in 2003, a group forming themselves, calling themselves the Friends of Liberty Hall, really petitioned the government and ra raised funds to have it refurbished. It was reopened in 2003, and since then we have been developing it into a cultural educational institution that serves members of the surrounding communities first and all others. And tell us about that service to members of the surrounding communities and, and everybody else. What does Liberty... So, as a result, we have a multimedia museum. It's the Marcus Messiah Garvey Multimedia Museum, the only museum in the world dedicated to his life and work, and the only fully multimedia museum in the Caribbean. So you can come, anyone can come and be immersed in three and a half hours of, of Garvey through eight interactive touch screens, through film, through, uh, you'll hear his voice, you'll hear others speak of Garvey, it's a wonderful museum. We also have a multimedia computer center where in the mornings we teach adults computer skills and in the afternoon we have our after school program where children get assistance with homework, with literacy, with math, with English, as well as learning computing. We also have a research and reference library where we have over 10,000 Pan-African books and, and other I, materials. I, I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> and other materials that is also available to anyone who wants to study Garvey, Africa, and the African diaspora. We have our events here in this Garvey Great Hall, which is where we are now. And we have capoeira for the children. We have uh, dance classes. Uh, As a matter of fact, classes, you have the summer school programs going on right now. Every summer we have summer arts. Mm -hmm. And this year we're doing Garvey Elocution. So it's a wonderful cultural educational institution. It really is beautiful. And, you know, we were here uh, uh, last, well, last week, uh, Tuesday, I think it was, yes. that we came in and had a grand tour and I uh, was, was quite impressed by what we see um, happening here. What are the long-term plans uh, in the works that you can share with us for Liberty Hall? Well, I believe we have satisfied, well, we've completely used the building. And the Institute of Jamaica, under which Liberty Hall falls, we actually fall under the African Caribbean Institute of Jamaica and Jamaica Memory Bank. The Institute purchased the building next door, which is the Odd Fellows Hall, for our expansion. And hopefully one day we'll raise enough funds to build the Amy Jakes Garvey Center for Pan-African Research. That will properly house the museum and allow us to attract archives, Garvey archives from all over the world. We hope to have a similar structure as the Schomburg. That is our vision to have. So that students, scholars from all over, and of course throughout our country, will be able to 
learn about Garvey. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, once again, welcome. You are, if you're joining us uh, on the 107s, we're coming to you live from Liberty Hall, the legacy of Moalimu Marcus Messiah Garvey. And we're also streaming live on the internet. So go log on to irfm.net and you can see the activities live here on the internet. Uh, Anku Jasaneb, once again, uh, that's Kimetian. It means life, prosperity, health. We want to welcome you to uh, the First in our series, the Africa Forum presents the Black Think Tank. The state of the race, 100 years after the founding of the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League. We want to say thanks, first of all, to the principals of Liberty Hall. We have been speaking with our curator and director. Donna McFarlane, but I want to say thanks also to Professor Rupert Lewis, uh, both so wholeheartedly supported IRFM and the Africa Forum, agreeing to make this important venue the place of IRFM's first Africa Forum presents Black Think Tank. Thanks also to the over 20 panelists who are participating in this symposium this morning. They're not all here yet, Amina, but they are coming, <laughs> participating in the, in the forum this morning. And uh, some of them at very short notice, let me just say, and without hesitation, and also some on their way at great cost to themselves, uh, time-wise and otherwise, but they're getting here. Also want to say thanks to those who are on their way and those who are here already uh, to the uh, Liberty Hall, the legacy of Moalumu Marcus Messiah Garvey this morning to be part of this historic moment. Also to you, our listeners, on the 107s, you can get us on the 107s, 107.1. We go to 107.2, 107.3, all the way to 107.9. To those of you who have logged on, irfm.net, and are now watching the live stream. Thanks to you. Uh, We know that you're watching from all parts of the world, the continent of Africa. So uh, thanks for joining us from Europe. Thanks for joining us. Uh, We're going to take a quick break and come right back. We're coming to you live from Liberty Hall. JN International Money Transfer. Safe, convenient, affordable. The time by JN Money Transfer is... Now 6... 18. Coming to you live from Liberty Hall at 76 King Street. It's on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the founding of the UNIA and ACL. Uh, We're going to be acknowledging our our panelists uh, more formally in a little while, but I really want to stop for a moment and also to acknowledge those upon whose shoulders we stand. And I want to make special mention of uh, two elders within the global Pan-African community who have been the driving forces behind this symposium talking about the powerful husband and wife team of doctors Julia and Nathan Hare, founders of the first black think tank, both uh, in the U.S., wanted to be part of this session, but uh, can't be. We want to especially send our prayers to Dr. Julia Hare, who now has uh, Alzheimer's, Dr. Nathan here, um, still very, 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 very active in the Pan-African community, but who in the early 90s uh, encouraged us to form black think tanks and encouraged me in particular to ensure that this is something that I did uh, in my capacity as a journalist. So I want to acknowledge both doctors, Julia and Nathan here. You know, uh, last week I spoke to, earlier this, well, last week, because this is Sunday, I spoke to uh, Minister Omar Davies, who is scheduled to join us here this morning as one of our panelists, and invited him as one of the late invitees uh, to participate uh, in the discussion this morning. Yes, Stephen is not on the, uh, <laughs> he's not on the program, but he, he is, oh, brilliant. Okay, so he's, he, but he said to me at the time, that uh, this is a very, this is a wide topic and uh, would need more than just four hours to do this. And I said to him, yes, you are totally correct. And that is why this is our first. We're kicking things off in this manner. But we're also saying that it's against its background that for the program this morning, we have identified uh, four critical areas in which to ground the deliberations. And... Um, 
through which we expect to uh, have a clear understanding of the state of the black race. This can be interrogated this morning. We're trying our best to do that. And also make determinations on actionable outcomes as we move ahead as a unified uh, team, a unified group, a unified race. So the four areas we're looking at this morning, the socioeconomic, political, security, and educational status of a black race 100 years after the founding of the UNIA and ACL. And we're asking, if, should we be optimistic or should we be concerned? But uh, in between all of that, we hope to get so much more. So let me just quickly tell you about the format of the program this morning and how things are going to go. So in terms of operationalizing the, the segments, I am joined by four co-moderators, one in each segment. And then you'll also find that panelists are at different times also co-moderators. So that in this first segment, as I introduced her before, Donna McFarlane, who is a curator and director of Liberty Hall, the legacy of Marcus Garvey, is joining me. And we'll be looking at the educational status of the black race 100 years after. In the second segment... Pan-African attorney at law, Bert Samuels, will co-moderate. And when I say co-moderate, it means that when they join me, they'll be doing most of the work. <laughs> we'll co-moderate the second segment, looking at the socio-political status of the black race. The third segment will explore the security status of the black race and will be co-moderated by President of the UNIA Kingston Division and uh, the Garvey Studies Chair of the Heidel Group of Schools, uh, Stephen Golding. Political scientist and Garvey scholar Professor Rupert Lewis moderates the fourth segment, the socioeconomic status of the black race. My colleague, international poet, host of a cutting edge and stepping razor on IRFM, Mutabuka, will lead a fifth and final segment in comments, questions, and answers. Each segment will run for just under 45 minutes, except for the subgroup looking at security, and this will run for, 40, for 30 minutes. At the beginning of each segment, panelists will make a very, very short statement, a very brief statement, and, well, if they want to, <laughs> but a very brief statement, and after which there will be a free flow of conversation among the panelists and moderators. At the, each, at the end of each segment, we'll take a few questions, so three or so, uh, for the panelists from the floor. Some of the panelists will have to leave after their segment. Some will stay on. And uh, um, as we go along, uh, towards the end of the program, we'll have an entire half an hour of to 45 minutes dedicated to taking the comments, questions, and so on from the floor. So it was a state of a black race it, by way of, of, of introduction that led Mualimu Marcus Masaya Garvey on July 20, 1914 to form the UNIA and ACL. Having traveled extensively throughout the Caribbean, Latin America and Europe, he observed the universal degradation of the black race. He feared that weak races were doomed to slavery and extinction. Molimu Marcus Masaya Garvey's vision and mission was for the emancipation of the African race everywhere. In fact, he wrote, I have given my time to the study of a condition of the race here, there, and everywhere, and I have come to realize that they are still the object of degradation and pity the world over in the sense that they have no status um, socially, nationally, or commercially. And this was then... We're talking about 100 years after the formation of the UNIA. Is, it, is this still resounding with us? Uh, should we be optimistic about the state of the black race? Or should we be concerned? And if concerned or optimistic, what then should our action be? Uh, Donna, I'm turning it over to you for the, to introduce the panelists in this segment uh, of the discussion and then for the conversation to continue. Okay, well, thank you. We have with us... Amina Blackwood Meeks, who is, where do I have her, founder of Tukuma, director of culture and education at the Ministry of Education, friend of Liberty Hall, <laughs> storyteller, storyteller, and so many other hats. We also have with us 
Stephen Golding, who is president of the Kingston UNIA and chair of Garvey Studies at Heidel Group of Schools. I see also Dr. Ashley Hamilton Taylor, who is here with us. Of the computing department. Who, yes, of the computing department, if I can just find it, at University, University of, of the West, West Indies. Indies. He is also donor. a friend and donor to Liberty Hall. So I welcome you three to us this evening. We are hoping to have join us um, Queen Mother Miriam Samad, Devon Evans, and is Michael Barnett also? No, no, no. Michael. All right, so please, shall we? We want to start from the, with the panelists just with a brief statement and then to go into uh, the discussion on the educational status of the black race. And of course we're saying the black race and we're doing this deliberately because we could talk about Jamaica in particular. But uh, the conversations we've been having over the years is that uh, wherever we are as black people, we, our conditions seem to mirror each other. And so I start with you, uh, Stephen Golding. President of the UNIA. Morning, Kabu. Morning, Donna. Morning to my fellow panelists, Amina and um, Dr. Taylor. Good to be here. 100 years to the day, um, the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League was founded. Not too far from here, right on the corner of Orange and Charles Street, where their first meeting was held. It's important for us to remember if we are looking at a discussion of education, to remember that one of the tenets of the UNIA upon its founding was to establish institutions for the racial education and culture of our people, our children. Marcus Garvey was very clear on stressing that. So if we're going to be talking about Garveyism from an educational standpoint, we have to understand that we're talking about racial education and racial culturing of our children, a topic that we are not necessarily comfortable with in Jamaica. Garvey said that when he founded this organization, people thought him crazy for even using openly the term Negro. Having studied in England, they thought, in his own words, he said he would come back and be one of the black whites of Jamaica. Um, but instead, Garvey was urging us towards knowledge of ourselves, of our history, and his own knowledge of us was so extensive. I mean, in 1921, the Universal Negro Catechism taught children about things like the history of Egypt, Ethiopia, of places like Meroe and Memphis, Timbuktu. We spoke about um, great, great ancestors of antiquity and the accomplishments of the race. Um, Garvey also had a contemporary, Joel Augustus Rogers, who did extensive research in terms of the history of our race and our achievements. All of this, both Garvey and himself, came out of a background of Ethiopianism. Many people may not know that Africans here in Jamaica, after emancipation, were taken back to Africa as missionaries to sort of evangelize and Christianize Africa. Um, out of that, they realized that a lot of the work that they did, they were not getting promoted in the church or move up higher in the clerical order of things. And so they combed the Bible looking for justification as to why they would be held down. Out of this comes a tradition of passages such as Psalm 68, 31, Princes shall come out of Egypt and Ethiopia shall stretch forth their hands. That formed the background base philosophy of, of what Garveyism grew out of. This yearning or this, this, this need to let the world know that we have a history too and we have a great place. We are the first race. We are the founders of civilization and a lot of that has been disconnected from our education coming out of slavery and the colonial experience. Garveyism speaks to bringing that back up and reinstituting it into our educational curriculum. Thank you very much, Stephen Golding. Amina Blackwood makes. Morning, Sister Andrea. Morning, brothers and sister panelists. Morning, brothers and sisters out there listening to Ari FM. Um, I had a very um, funny thought this morning that Garvey really was a visionary and he must have seen that Irie FM would have a program called Running African and that the 20th of July would fall on a Running African morning so that um, we could be celebrating Garvey well, and the UNIA. So give thanks for Marcus Garvey and that reason for bringing us uh, together once more. I 
think that one of the things we have to do when we talk about education of the black race, using Jamaica as the example, mm-hmm. that we know what the deficiencies are. We really need to have a conversation about what we mean by education. And having had that conversation about what we mean by education, I think we need to decide what function the education should serve. Looking at where our education um, structure and system came from, the industrial age in Britain, where children were streamed to be one thing or the other, we find that 52 years after independence, we still have an education system that is largely based on streaming children. So we're looking for which stream we're going to put them into. It means that we have either consciously or unconsciously bought into the fact that there is inequity in the system and there will always be inequity in the system. So as a people, we need to decide what is the function of education? Is it to conform, reform, or transform. If we don't decide that, we're going to curse the education system that children can't pass their exams, whatever that means, to go to a good school, whatever that means, but we find that we who are cursing the system benefit from the inequities. Mm-hmm. We can go to the country and get a nice little girl to come and be with me. And if she married or have a boyfriend, then him can come to and be the nice little boy who clean up the yard. And unless we have the con- conversations about what is education, what is its purpose, and are we going, still going to be true to what we have inherited, then we are going to be operating like butchers, cutting out a little piece here and a little piece there, but we're not really transforming the system to suit an agenda that we decide by ourselves, for ourselves and our children. Thank you very much, uh, Amina Blackwood Meeks, and now to Dr. Ashley Hamilton Taylor. Yes, greetings, Sister Gabu, and greetings, greetings to all the listeners who are seeking higher knowledge, conscious knowledge. Marcus Garvey, um, from very early, recognized the importance of science and technology in building our peoples and the importance of communication. Um, he uh, established a vast communication network before the existence of the internet or modern technology. Um, in fact, if um, it should be our aim to try to establish that level of communication using our modern technology that Garvey did without modern technology. Um, We are now in an age where the communication technologies, ICTs as they are called, computers, cell phones, tablets, and so forth, um, have the capability to distribute uplifting information, but they're also a double-edged sword, and they're being used um, unconsciously or consciously for... Uh, the dissemination of demoralizing and worthless information. The exact opposite and media. Um, the exact opposite of what uh, Garvey was teaching us so many years ago. So I think um, as a challenge going forward, we need to see how we can use what these are. Um, technologies and science to move forward, um, whether it's in Jamaica, the Caribbean, in Africa in particular. And we need to do that because there are others who are making plans about how to use these technologies to institute a sort of third wave of information and digital colonialism and, and digital colonialism, colonialism. Information, colonialism and wow. um, I'm not uh, other parts of the world recognize this and they are taking steps so um, whether it's Europe or Asia they are making plans for how to um, control their own agendas 
and how to take advantage of the current age. And I'm sure Garvey would have been thinking that way, and it is up to us to follow in his thinking and advance, build on it. Very, very important point you're making there. Thank you very much, Dr. Ashley Hamilton Taylor. Uh, one of the things I, I, I heard um, coming from you, Stephen Golding, is uh, the idea of racial education. And you talk about the extent to which we are courageous enough or not to, to embark upon this path, which is a path that Mualamu Marcus Mazaya Garvey intended. How far are we off that track and what does it mean, racial education? I'm not sure that we are much further down the road than a hundred years ago when Garvey conceived this great confraternity. Um, race is something we're uncomfortable with in this country and we've got to be honest and, and open about it. Um, consider even the fact that we, we focus not on race but on color in this country. We speak a lot about color. We describe each other by color. Even though you may be talking about a red man, that red man is still of the Negro race, um, according to how Garvey would define it. But yet we... Can we just get we, something we, out of the way? Stephen is going to say Negro a lot. I'm going to disagree that we should not be using the word Negro, <laughs> but we're not going to be fighting about it today. No, we're not All fighting. Right. But you yes. know, I have to hold true to it in my office as president of the, of the mm -hmm. organization and yes. in understanding that, I mean, the organization is the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities. Let me not take you off track. Garvey said he meditated for two days and two nights before he came up with the name. Am I going let off me track? Not take I you off back track. to exactly yes. what I'm saying. Yes. Garvey was bold enough to use that because even in his time, people were uncomfortable with it. And it goes back to what I'm saying about the fact that we are uncomfortable with race, the discussion of race. We have a, 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 we have a system in this country coming out of slavery where you have children who you, you had people who are the children of the slave master as well as the slave. And so we have we, 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 we become comfortable in defining ourselves as Jamaicans as opposed to defining ourselves as black people or as Negroes if, if you are comfortable. Or as Africans. Word, or as Africans. Um, that's no different today. That's not, in, in my classes and in my own lectures, you still have Jamaicans blacker than me in color, right, who will tell you that they're not African. They're Jamaicans. So what really has changed in a hundred years in terms of coming to terms with our identity and really embracing the philosophies of Garveyism, who saw to a universal uniting of the race? You can't do that if you see yourself separate from the Trinidadian or the Belizean or the Nigerian or the Ghanaian. And it's not something that just Jamaicans suffer from, but other people. In terms of Garveyism and moving forward in Jamaica, we need to make ourselves comfortable with the discussion of race. And I'll give you an example. George William Gordon, who our parliament is named after, is the son of a... Casting live from Liberty Hall, the legacy of Marcus Garvey. We want to welcome um, you as you continue to come in. Uh, my colleague, Muta Boga, who will be taking the microphone later on in the program, as we said earlier, has joined us. Also, Sonia Harris, our sister, has joined us uh, in the audience. Later on will be a panelist. My brother, Jerry Small, is also in the audience. And these are some of the panelists who you'll be hearing from later. My name is Kabu, Kabu Ma'at Karu. And my co-moderator in this segment is... Donna McFarlane. All right. Yes, go ahead. Donna. And on that note, I just want to interject about how, we are, how in, within our educational system this is operationalized. When you look at the pre-K to all the way to high, through high school curriculum, particularly social studies, I see the master narrative continuing. That is the narrative of discovery, the silencing of the work of the, of the life of the Taino people of its over 5,000 years of history, and certainly the erasure of the history of African people before their enslavement. How are we looking, are we in fact looking at the textbooks that our children use, and are we using a more culturally informative praxis to change the narrative, to democratize the narrative, to take it away from the master narrative that has, you know, oppressed us for so long. 
I don't know about democratizing the narrative, but we have to make sure that we're using the right narrative. And you're right. We have been given a colonial and master narrative, which does not add to the rehabilitation of our people following the, the African ma for the African Holocaust. And it does not add to the creation of wealth amongst our people because of how they view themselves. One of Marcus Garvey's greatest quotes was, if you have no confidence in self, you're twice defeated in the race of life. All of that comes out of the system of oppression and colonialism that we have been through. Um, we need to change the narrative, Donna. We have African narratives that we can institute. One of the things the Universal Negro Catechism does is introduces those topics um, to members, to, to young members from the primary level. And this is important. I did a lecture the other day with the young ladies who are kept at... Um, the center there at Up Park Camp and asked a question. This is a room full of all black people, my race. I asked them if they know where the statue, they if they've ever heard of the Statue of Liberty. Yes. Where is it? Uh, America. Have you heard of the Eiffel Tower? I thought they wouldn't get this one. Yes. Where is it? Paris. Have you heard of the Great Sphinx? No. Don't know where it is. And these are girls who are 12, 13, and 14, because even when I was in school, I don't remember any teacher ever mentioning the great swings of Egypt. Never. And that stands as a testimony, one of the primary visual great wonders of the world that is attributed and um, um, black people can claim. Well, in fact, Egypt is always portrayed as being outside of Africa in some innoxious place like the Middle East. The master narrative again. We have to change that narrative. And, and so when we talk about education, and it's really one of the things that I'm very proud of the UNI and Marcus Garvey, his mind and the, the knowledge that he was exposed to at such an early part of the 20th century was so extensive that he spoke of these things even a hundred years ago. Up to today, you still cannot show me something from the educational booklets or curriculum that goes into depth about these things. We're still focused on being Jamaican and Caribbean and writing this script, which is a script written by the children of the plantocracy. So, Amina, what's happening in the Ministry of Education in this regard? I'm not here to speak on behalf of the Ministry of Education. I am very intrigued by the way you pose the question about what is being done in regard to textbooks and uh, the content of the curriculum and so on. The first point I want to make, Stephen has already alluded to it, is that we cannot know what we have not been taught. We clearly cannot know what we have not been taught. So those of us who have come into a knowledge of the things we are seeing our children need to know automatically have a responsibility. Like Garvey looked around and said, where then is the black man king and him never see any? And his conclusion was, if we ask the question, we have a responsibility to be the answer. The second thing that um, struck me in the formulation of the question, which is a question I hear um, fairly often, what is being done? And the flip side of that question is, who is to do it? We are almost appealing to the owners of the plantation to change the plantation, and we're not even going inside. We're knocking at the gate to say, I, I have a, are you, do no. There is a way in which we now have to go inside of the place, wherever we are. A building and a system and a structure called the Ministry of Education that is still wedded to something that we have inherited in a context where we have not decided what kind of state we want to be. Is not going to get up and say, now let me comb the curriculum and change the books. However, well, I mean, no, oh, go ahead. however since the program <laughs> oh my is God. on my desk, um, one of the things that we are clear about is that we cannot transform the way people think. I like the way you put it, Stephen, rehabilitate. We can't talk about the reparation of the mind um, using alien methodologies. 
So one of the things that we have been looking at is what does it mean to have an African-centered education? That's what I was going to ask you. So go right What ahead. are the, the, the cultural systems and expressions that we have in Jamaica that carry the kind of information that some of us within and outside of the system would want our children to learn? What is the place of Proverbs? and riddles and storytelling in the way we raise ourselves. What is the place of Kumina and revivalism? What is the connection between Marcus Garvey and Paul Bogle and Bedward in, in the way we raise our children? So that we have been looking at a distinction between a program and a curriculum. Mm -hmm. And what we have been seeing is that the curriculum is the various subjects are in a box. You know, and so the geography teacher can say, I don't teach English. So you can make all the mistakes you want when you write in the essay and you don't pass, even if you have the content because your, your, your way of communicating is incorrect and he or she not correct it. Mm -hmm. So what How about a programmatic approach? What about a programmatic approach to education, to teaching Garveyism? What if when I went to my ICT class, I was asking myself, how is it that in a time without internet, without computer, Garvey managed to have 5,000 copies of one issue of his newspaper in five different languages. I mean, what would that translate? When we go to our art and craft class, for example, could we build a scale model of the three ships of the Black Star Line? Yes. So those are some of the things we have been interrogating. In the first two years of the program, there have been no written texts. Because now our teachers also have to learn that a text don't mean something with a page you can flip. It means a song by Queen Africa, or by Taurus Riley, or by Burning Spear. It means a, a, a photograph. And, and so we have been looking at, uh, sorry this example is just so wrong at this point in time, but how could we use a photograph of the football team of Brazil to teach the middle passage. That takes some time. And then we have also been gathering from the children, not just what they create, but the questions that they ask and indicate what they want to know to inform in what direction the text should go. I want to welcome uh, Queen Mother Mariam Samad, who has joined us uh, at, the, at the table. Thank you very much, Mother Samad, uh, for coming in. And uh, while we get her microphone and so on ready, uh, you have said, and we're going to come back. I know you want to respond, Stephen, and, and we want to pick up on something. Amina I'm said, sorry that I'm late, but it was a man that made me late, my cabbie. <laughs> Welcome, Mother Samad. We're very, very happy uh, to have you uh, in this space as we look at the state of the black race 100 years after Mualamu Marcus Messiah Garvey. Devon Evans has also joined us. Devon, I know, coming all the way from St. Anne. Devon, thank you very much. Uh, I think you're in this segment also, so uh, take a chair there. And we said earlier uh, in our introduction that the panelists who are here, the people who are coming in here today, are coming in from all across Jamaica at great cost to themselves, time-wise and otherwise. So we really do appreciate that. It's interesting that when you reach out, and maybe Stephen's uh, experience is different from mine, having been talking to the Ministry of Culture, but as far as we're concerned, if, as you, if you reach out uh, to government, to ministries, to private sector for sponsorship of events like these, you either get no response or you get a boot. And the Ministry of Culture has decided to give us the boot on this one. Um, they have not responded. Yes, Stephen? They have not responded. Um, we asked them to partner with us on this uh, uh, symposium, and they have declined to do so. But that is neither here nor there. Thank you very much for coming in, all the way from St. Anne, uh, Devon. We want to go quickly to uh, Dr. Ashley Hamilton uh, Taylor, because you talked, Ashley, just now about um, the digital colonization, and that to me um, is an aha moment. And I'm saying, yeah, right. I, I, I haven't used the term, but I'm going to be using it now because I understand what it is, but I want you to delve into that a little bit more and tell us what that means. Well, um, if you look at how knowledge was passed traditionally in African societies, 
And, uh, All right, I don't think we're hearing you too well, Ashley. Okay. Um, you know, there, there's a tradition of storytelling, learning from your elders, and so forth. Um, what the current um, technology, how it, how it has been sold to people and how it's been used, is that young people, instead of interacting with their elders, are now glued and almost addicted to their smartphones, tablets, and computers. And the types of things that they're doing on these, I mean, it's, it's, it is quite possible to do very useful things. But the things that are being pushed on there um, are not useful for the most part. Mm. So the forms of social interaction, how they interact on Facebook and so forth, is basically uh, trivial at best for the most part, and sometimes worse. And these mechanisms are also, so this is at one level in terms of the children, in terms of the broader society, adults. Um, everything we do on these platforms is being permanently recorded. And in, on these platforms is being permanently recorded. And in some cases, analyzed by whoever controls these platforms. And um, going forward, we need to, to look at a process of how we are going to make proper use of these technologies, um, avoid certain behaviors um, that encourage whatever moral degradation, quarreling instead of unity and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, how we're going to use it in a positive way and eventually build our own and control our own platforms. And I think that that is critical uh, going ahead in terms of how we use the technologies when we talk about uh, moving the race forward. Uh, Stephen, I know you want to respond to something Amina said, but we're going to uh, ask both Devon and Mother Samad, uh, first of all, to uh, just give a quick um, brief opening statement uh, to the topic of uh, the educational status of the black race 100 years after the founding of the UNIA and ACL. We'll start with you, Mother Samad. Uh, good morning, and I'm... Uh... <laughs> Good morning, and I'm sorry I am late on this day. On time, thank you, darling. But I got up at 2 o'clock this morning, getting ready for this day and feeling magnific magnificent about this day, that in my 92nd year, you know, I'm the nearest to the 100, I think, yes, yes. that I have been given the title of Frank Gordon, Historian, I saw it in the newspaper. Thank you very much for that. And can you imagine the historian being late? But um, as far as education is concerned, which makes me laugh today, um, there's a young man somewhere in this lovely country by the name of Dingwall who puts us down every... He writes well. I like to read his writings. But there's a book here in my hand called... The Ruins, and it's by uh, C.F. Um, Count, Count Volney. And in this book says, there now walks amongst us a people now despise. And the thing he, that he goes on to say about us as a people, there's no one, I think, in the world can disprove it. Because he wrote it in 1757, I think. And I hope that somewhere here today, Mr. Dingwall sneaks in and uh, listens. <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting me. All right. If you uh, didn't invite me, I'd still be listening. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Appreciate it. We would have done this without you. Uh, Devon? Yes. Uh, morning again, and um, I also apologize for being late. <laughs> Looking at education, um, in terms of Marcus Garvey, I would say there is some fear in T 
teaching garbage to the people of Jamaica. And when I say fear, I, it, I say from a standpoint, the approach, the approach in school, the approach in the communities. And I don't know what we, we, we need to be emboldened to approach God. The subject is not one that would will, will um, win friends, probably might get you most enemies. But what we are saying, if Garvey is so important to us, and the institutions of Garvey are so important to us, why not we embrace it wholeheartedly? Why, why we don't approach Garveyism in the same way that we, the same people, will pour our hearts out for the two major political parties here. We'll do anything they want us to do. But when it comes to Marcus Garvey, there's some form of fear, there's some holdback, or there's a common design to and not to enlighten the people about the, this man and the state of their race. So what we want to say today, and I'm happy that I am here on this anniversary, we, the houses, the activists, all the mansions, organizations of Marcus Garvey need to find a common ground to come together because the government, the educational institutions there, they are not as committed as us. And we need to take this as our own initiative and the thoughts, whatever the people are looking for us for that guidance. And I agree with you on that, Devon. We need to go forward as a people and not be dependent. I don't want to hear we're waiting on the ministry to put education in school. We can put education in school from our homes, from the corners, wherever. That is the type of approach because there's and this much is, for us And this learn. is what I heard you saying, uh, Sister Amina, when you talked about um, we're knocking on the doors of, of the, 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 the enslavers uh, to tell us where to go and how to go. Yeah, and I and, and I, I totally support what Brother Devon is saying about what education is. It's part of what I, I, I meant when I said we have to decide what we mean by education. Our children learn wonderful things in school that when they come outside of the school gate, there is no place to apply or to see it manifested. Take something very simple like standing in line to be served. When them reach the school, get them now standing in no line because it's 300 of them and two bus. So we have to transform the entire society so that what our children learn in school finds a field in which it can be, it can be applied. Um, we did approach the Minister of Education, <laughs> the Garvey program, um, has as part of the programmatic approach what happens in the wider society. So in the year that Garvey turned 125, we actually en encountered a 1,250 bus drivers and taxi operators who are in the centers where school children take um, public transport to go home to say, listen to this about Marcus Garvey and hang on to the CD with Marcus Garvey's voice and hear what he's saying so that when the children come into your bus or your taxi, you can at least engage them. We really don't have any control over how that seed grows. But but it is these kinds of initiatives that will transform the society so that we do not see ourselves disconnected from the process of education inside a classroom. All right, we do have to wrap this segment, but we're going to do one thing first, and it's to take um, Stephen's response, then we go to a break, come back, and, and wrap this segment. Go ahead, Stephen. Um, just responding to, to what Amina and Devon were saying in terms of we can't be waiting on others to do for us. We need to do for ourselves. And we have to remember why Marcus Garvey was so successful in his time. It, Marcus Garvey wouldn't be asking the ministry to do nothing for him. Garvey built up a confraternity. And lots of, a lot of times we tend to separate Marcus Garvey from the organization. But it is the organization that strengthened him. It is the organization that accomplished many of the things we attribute to this, just this one man. 
and the organization was not one man. The UNIA had their own schools. They built the Booker T. Washington University. They built Liberty University. They built a seminary school. They trained their children outside of the regular classroom that those children were going to. So when we talk about all these Garvey organizations and this need to come together, we, you're right, but we need to know what we come together on. There are institutions outside of our race that have lasted for generations. Even as we talk about reparations now, we're trying to track some of these European companies that have existed from that time till now. What about the black institutions? We abandoned the black institutions. All right, hold that there, Stephen, because what, that is taking us directly into how we wrap up, because it's pointing us how do we go forward and what do we go forward on, as you, you have posed that question. All right, we are coming to you live from Liberty Hall, the legacy of Marcus Garvey at 76 King Street. We take a quick break. You are listening to IRFM. We'll be right back. ATL Automotive Limited, your authorized distributors for Honda, Volkswagen, Audi, Jaguar, and Land Rover, is is open on Saturdays from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. The time by ATL Automotive is now nine minutes after seven o'clock. You're inside of the Africa Forum, Running Africa, and we're broadcasting live from Liberty Hall, the legacy of Moalimu Marcus Mazaya Garvey. It is on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the founding of the UNIA and ACL. And interestingly, it is 100 years to the day because it's July 20, 1914, that the organization was founded and it today is July 20, 2014. So we feel that this is a historic moment. It means something. We might all be in a time warp. We don't know what we're in here. Hopefully when all this is all done, we'll all find ourselves, as Devon is suggesting, in the, in a similar place. Because we, I, I do believe that we are working towards the same thing, which is African liberation, the liberation of the race, the full and total emancipation of the race. How do we do this? How we, do we go forward uh, using or through the medium of education. My sister Amina is posing the question, what is education? So we do have to get there first, Amina. That is something that we have to decide on. We have to agree what is education, because how is education viewed? You talk about structures and systems and so on. So once we have determined that, how do we move forward? Devon, since you came in a little bit late and didn't get much time. Okay, yes. <laughs> I'm saying, and I heard what Simu said, there's a lot of organizations uh, relating to Garvey. We have the, the Marcus Garvey People's Political Party, we have the UNIA, we have Liberty Hall here, and Liberty Hall in Manchester. I'm saying... And of course, IRFM. IRFM. Garvey, one of the things that guided the movement and guided the organization is the love for each other and unity amongst the race. Here we are, I'm in this movement for many years, and when we go out, we don't trust each other. If we'll hear Steve eloquently um, speak about Garvey, and then you have others will say, we don't trust Steve. We have Miguel Lan, who will champion the cause of the PPP, and then on the other, you have Bridget on the side say, we don't trust Miguel or we don't want to learn. I myself have been out there as a candidate for the Marcus Garber party. And when I'm on the, out there, people on the side holding back, looking, I'm trying to say they don't deal with politics. It's X wrong. And we find all sorts of things to divide ourselves. All of us must can find a common ground on which to start because if we are not united as people of Marcus Garvey we are not going anywhere One and you suggest that this common ground is what? The, well we need to, first of all as organizations we have never met all these Marcus Garvey organizations have never met we need to find a time to meet discuss our issues put away petty differences 
put that on, on personal differences. Yeah. And even though we're meeting on air now, this is one of the yes, first meetings. Yes, this is a good start. That's why I <laughs> make every effort to be here. Because I yes. don't want this program to end today where we cannot find a way where each and every one of us can meet together and we start this unity. We are not united. We are divided as Garveyites. Yes. And until we can mend this ground, we are not going anywhere. Let me just say, Nana Erna Broadband has, has provided a, a, a really a brilliant space in Woodside in St. Mary called Black Space. And let me just throw that out because that is a, 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 a space that um, without any kind of that is ideal. Kindness, can we say. Could yes, I just interject ahead. here, Kabul, because I hear what Devon is saying. But let us not forget that Garvey set out the black print, as I call it, you know. Um, Gavi formed a lot of organizations, yes, but he had a base vehicle, which was the Universal Negro Improvement Association. And that is, that is a racial confraternity. He kept the religion out of it. He kept the politics out of it. He said we should organize collectively based on race. Not labor, not politics, not religion. That is not the thread that holds the UNI together. It is race. Out of that organization came several auxiliaries, the Universal Negro Political Union in America, the PPP, um, labor unions, other things came out of the confraternity. But that was the, the, the platform that Garvey built. So we should not be a hundred years asking, what is it we can unite on? Race is what we are supposed to unite on. Every member of the PPP was a member of the UNIA. Every shareholder so, so the point in the Black making, Star Stephen, Line was a member of the UNIA. So what was the point? Is the point the you're point making? I'm making is Garvey created a confraternity, uh, uh, an organization based on race to unite us. And out of that organization, we choose which different directions we want to go into. So we need a political party, we form it out of the confraternity. We need ships, we form companies out of the confraternity. That was the black print. That's how Garvey wrote. So you're saying there's so no all way these forward? Marcus Garvey groups. Are you saying, Stephen, that there is no way forward outside of the UNIA for the race? I'm not saying there is way. no way forward, Andrew. I'm just saying if we are going to give such accolades to Marcus Garvey and speak about how great he is, let us look at what made him great. It was how he thought, it was how he formulated, it is how he strategized. And what he did was say the first thing we need to do is unite as a race, create a confraternity where we are all brothers and sisters, where we raise our children. So, And through that collective strength, economically and otherwise, we'll be able to create now our own institutions our own schools so we don't have to beg the we'll ministry, the our UNIA. own businesses so we don't have to look sponsorship. That was what UNIA was created oh, for. We it look has sponsorship from our own businesses. It, exactly. It hasn't yes. changed a hundred years later, We're but we have to know that the UNIA was targeted um, misinformation, a counterintelligence program was brought against it. This is where we get this thing about we don't trust this one and we don't trust that one. We have to go back to the Constitution. Yeah, but how can, will the UNIA be this galvanizing force? Because if you say we have to lead through the UNIA, because all the organizations of Garvey, if the UNIA, we understand that Garvey created the UNIA to hold us together. But what are we doing? Can we come together as UNIA to bring this unity. We have been talking about we unity can come from together, ever since. Devon, if we choose to. That is why in 1920, mm -hmm. 25,000 delegates sat for 30 days to create a constitution. Our loyalty must not be to personality. So I don't business whether people like Stephen Golding or not. If you believe in the constitution of the organization, take up a membership, let your voice be heard. If you don't like the leadership, put yourself up for election. Garvey tried to create within us the mechanism of of a nation, of nation building. But I heard you say at the beginning, Stephen, in the interest of time, because you're going to be here for a little while longer, also as, as, as a, as a co-moderator, which we can pick up on some of those issues. But in the interest of time, so I heard Devon saying there needs to be a sit-down among us who have a similar outlook, who want the very same things for the race, which at the end of the day is African liberation. Um, I heard you said that yes, this is something that we need to do, but then you go on to say that, and it sounds as if this is what you're saying, that we do this, but we only do this through the UNIA. And I need you to find, I need, I need for, no, hold on, Stephen, yeah. because remember, we're broadcasting 11 people hearing this, yeah. and I'm speaking through the voice, the voice of the people. Uh, is this what you're saying? Yeah, but when you put it that way, you know, um, Kabu, there, 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 we, we have some ways that we think as a people, 
we don't join this group and we don't join that group or it's this group and it's that group and it's that leader yeah. and so we are resistant so I don't want it to come across that I'm saying listen it to you and I what I'm saying is that Gavi's idea of us choosing race to be the, the factor okay. that unites us is excellent we see we see the dangers of where religion has taken us we see the dangers of where politics has taken us. These things have divided us as a race. When we are targeted universally as a race, there's no difference between poverty of black people in the West Indies and poverty of black people in Africa. We're still poor. We're still exactly. disorganized. We still have political corruption because we have not come to terms with the fact that Garvey said it is upon race that we must unite. All right, so let us go. Let us hear from the other panelists in terms of how do we move forward as we wrap this segment. Sister Amina? Well, I'll tell I you. Think one of the things, I'm sorry. Go yes, go ahead. ahead. One of the things I have to congratulate you for on this 100th anniversary is that this is the best looking center for people to meet of all of the UNIA and the, like goofs that I have ever been in, and I think I've been in quite a few, especially across the United States. This building is just about the best looking. I have to congratulate you, because <laughs> uh, most of the Garvey uh, centers are a bunch of raggedy looking places. That <laughs> Sorry about that, but at 92, I had to say it. Uh, and another thing, don't look to me for any dues, okay? I'm 92 years old and I ain't paying dues to nobody. I pay dues in service. All my life I've been servicing and thank God for Garvey, I have had someone strong to lean on. He's the only black man I know who's ever really backed me, even though he's in his grave. And Tony Martin, who wrote the book Race First, understood exactly what the young brother's talking about. Race First is it. I don't care where I've gone in the world. I've looked off in a mountain and saw a black man and said, oh my God, black man, you know? Thank you, Mother Samad. Race First, uh, Sister Amina. Yes. Our ancestors have left some wonderful phrases with us. One of them is each one teach one. And it wasn't just a phrase, it was a practice. And I think we have to get back to that practice where what we know, we teach other people. I say that to say that we who know Marcus Garvey and we who believe in Marcus Garvey need to give Marcus Garvey to the people. There are times when we wear the knowing of Marcus Garvey as if that make us special and it separates us so we can be better than those who don't Marcus Garvey, don't know Marcus Garvey. If we don't change that a hundred years from now, we're still going to be having that conversation. So yes, I agree. There needs to be a meeting of the mind. There needs to be a recognition that we all want the same thing, that we all subscribe to the same agenda gender and part of that work is to give Marcus Garvey to the people so they understand who he, he still is and what he represents about our future. All right. Uh, Dr. Ashley Hamilton Taylor, we're wrapping this segment with you in terms of how we move forward. Well, in terms of education, I think we need to tackle, um, we need to tackle things at all levels. We need to tackle it from the level of the universities and the colleges because this is where we're going to get our future teachers from scientists media people and so forth and there is a, a battle that's on for the minds of our young adults at that level because there is a realization that if you influence the thinking and if we actually quote some of the people out the thinking, how thinking about how to think. If you tackle people at that level, then you start to influence the entire society. Um, so it needs to be, that's going to be an important thing looking forward. Um, in terms of science and technology, which you asked me to address yes. in particular, it's important what I found from over 30 years of teaching at university level is that your scientists and technologists is not enough for them just to have scientific and techno technical knowledge. 
they need they need to think need to be able to appreciate what they can do with it for their people and not just for themselves individually mm -hmm. and if you look at other areas of the world that are advancing whether it's India or China and so forth this is built in I mean it's built in I've tried to incorporate some of this in the curriculum um, that, um, in, in my work and you know that needs to happen across the Pan-African world. Thank you very much Dr. Ashley Hamilton Taylor. We hope uh, Donna that this doesn't end here. The four, the four subgroups, um, education, socio-economic, socio-political security, are pretty, pretty critical to the advancement of the race, of the African race, so that we have started, or we, we're continuing that discussion here, and we have identified panelists who have given um, brilliant submissions um, here this morning. How do we move, even within the groups, the subgroups, and together as a wider group in terms of making these actionable, in terms of action learning. We are what we do, not what we say. I think is where we are. Well, I really appreciate the each one teach one reminder because each of us in our own spaces have access to, to children and have access to opportunities to pass on knowledge. Here at Liberty Hall, we have used Sankofa as a means of doing that. We get together last, this year we had 320 student teachers from the eight teachers colleges as well as the three departments of education come together at the conference center and we linked by videocast with Medgar Evers on the topic of how the activities and, and forms of the UNIA, enterprises of the UNIA, teach us uh, self-reliance and, and self-identity. And it was an amazing session with, with our teachers, and I think that our teachers have to be the focus. But I'm not yet ready to give up on the Ministry of Education. Not when I say give up, I mean that we call ourselves independent, we say we are running a nation, and if we're running a nation for our people, then we must force the Ministry of Education to represent our history in a way that remembers us. And when I say remember, I mean to put back the pieces of, of black history for our children. And I think it is important for us to push for that. Within, within this country. Responsibility of a state. Thank you very much uh, in this segment. Thank you very much to my co-moderator, uh, Donna uh, McFarlane. Thank you very much to our panelists, Stephen Golden, uh, Sister Amina Blackwood-Meeks, Dr. Ashley Hamilton-Taylor, Queen Mother Mariam Samad, and Devon Evans. Our next uh, subgroup will be looking at the socio-political uh, status of the black race as we discuss the state of the race 100 years later. A quick break and we'll be right back. Sagical Life Insurance is what... Welcome again to our listeners on the 107s, 107.1 all the way to 107.9 and to our listeners on the internet at irfm.net. We are streaming live on the internet, so if you log in to irfm.net right now, you'll be able to see the entire proceedings as we uh, go through this morning. In this segment of the program, I'm joined by my co-moderator, Pan-African Attorney at Law, Bert Samuels. He's going to be taking you through this segment, and I've been saying to Bert that I'm here just to give a time signal uh, as you take over this segment, as we welcome Bert, uh, uh, Nana, Dr. Erna Broadba, uh, uh, Becky, uh, Patrick Beckford from the 12 Tribes of Israel is in the house, also uh, Brother Clive Mohammed from a Nation of Islam, and so many others who have joined us uh, in the house this morning. All right, uh, so in this segment of the program, we will be looking at the socio our political status as we examine the state of the race. It's over to you, Bert Samuels. Greetings to the IRFM family. Yes, we always say as Pan-Africanists that the ancestors are pleased. Uh, we came, were brought here some into slavery and uh, the ancestors rose up uh, the Honorable Marcus Garvey to be a leader of the people. 
100 years to the day. In true African tradition, we also wish to honor Queen Mother Semaj. She has been a warrior. She's 92 years old, and she's in the house. And in true African tradition, we honor the elders and the princess and the queen, Semaj. We are glad to have you with us. You have been a Garveyite who have articulated the words and works of Marcus Garvey that has made us so proud. In this section, the social political status after 100 years of Garveyism, we have the honor of Muta Baruka, who is a renowned Doug Poet, Pan-Africanist and talk show host, Jerry Small, straight up with New Stock, a radio host and a historian. We have Brother Miguel Lohan, I, don't, I prefer to call him the educator rather than the attorney at law, a Pan-Africanist who has given his life to the struggles of the African people. There are other panelists which I don't Dr. have a Arthur notice Green, who, um, uh, come who will Doctor Green, medical doctor, author and founder of the African Liberation Movement, and Dr. Imani Tafari Ama, also talk show host, sociologist and gender specialist, hosting the program uh, Fresh Start on News Talk 93. You know, at this point, we wish to, to look and examine since uh, 100 years of Garveyism, the social political status that we have found ourselves. And a, a kind of warped example of, of where we have reached is, is shown in my own experience. In 1995, a gunman entered my house and tied myself up and my wife and robbed us of all we had. And when they're about to leave, they said, uh, we're only going to spare you because we noticed that in your house, Bob, us. You have a lot of picture of Marcus Garvey. I will for sure respect wow. to Marcus. And in, in a kind of way, you know, it's, it's funny. So that you know, Jamaica has brought out a very negative part of our, us and a very positive part. And even amongst the, the robbers and thieves, they said they spared our lives because we had placed the pictures of Marcus Garvey and they saw that we were roots people. So this, this competing bleaching and rasta going in the same country has been a feature of Jamaica and that blends into the social political status that we are in now to discuss it because Jamaica has produced a bolt. You know, when they call upon us to run and we, we go to the top of the world, but they don't call upon our race to lead. They don't call upon our race to be great entrepreneurs. They look to us for certain things. But when it comes to their queen, beauty queen contests, they, they put up things that we don't qualify as race first. And as we have heard today, Marcus said it's race first. So I'm going to hand over, firstly, I'm going to say, Brother Jerry Small, you seem to be biting at the bits to come into this segment. Let us hear you on the political, socio-political status of our people, 100 years of Garvey's in. Well, thank you very much, Bert, and thank you, Cabo, and RFM, and thank you, Marcus Garvey. Now, I just want to make some points. I want to make a speech. Liberty all must be returned. Liberty all must be returned to the UNIA. And Marcus Garvey, residence of a lady must be road, and the one over the other side, where club in the Archibald must be returned to Gavi family. Now, what stopped those things from happening? Look back 100 years on you and I. Look back 200 years on the Maroon movement. And look back 50 years, not on Rastafari movement, but some of the organizations of Rastafari. I went to the 12 tribe of Israel, Ethiopian child, World Federation, child of 15, as an example of Rastafari. Um, the membership of the UNIA. The people who control you and I are not accountable to the membership and to the citizens. The Maroon Colonel them and the committee that control the Maroon communities are not accountable to the Maroon community. They run and control them, just like old PNP is run by the executive and the prime minister and the cabinet and the member them just follow up first, follow what I'm saying. The 12 tribe of Israel, the strongest organization ever rise up in a Rastafari. It, 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 from, from even before Brother Gad passed away, the founder, one of the founders, even before it passed away, the leadership not accountable to the members. The leadership dictate to the members, and members just go along with what Brother Gad said or what the executive said. No strong people can run so. Next thing now, FBI was formed just around the time when you and I get strong. Hoover was, was a 26-year-old and was the first director. He was director for over 50 years, till after Kennedy dead. One of the first projects of the FBI. 
was to counteract any body ways that threat to American government. And the UNIA was one of the first projects them learn of. And Marcus Gia was one of the first targets. We must gear up ourselves now to be aware of operations like the FBI. The Minister of Education, we're not supposed to negotiate with the Minister of Education about nothing. We, the African people, are not supposed to negotiate with none of the political parties and none of them. We're supposed to challenge the political system. We, no negotiation. We as individuals must be determined to implement personal partnership with one another in a business and all different kind of things. We must be prepared for that. And not just as a charity, you know. If you make money and prosper, but we, must, but we have to search and know who to trust enough. Yeah. We must develop skills to detect infiltration. <laughs> and skills to detect gangsterism. Because anything successful, gangster will come amongst it and try to control it. Not a rap. Don't apologize. I promise. I'm so sorry. I remember. All right, we do apologize for that. Side. I hope right, that we were right. able to, all right. not a to dump that. Let me know, Ricky, if you we were able to dump that. that. Not a backside of where I love. Gangsterism for infiltrate and take over the African people thing like what they call PNP and JNP. And our organization and institution them and our businesses, like the bank is the bank, them the banks are not accountable to the bank, the people who have the bank account. The, the people who have the bank account is like the shareholder in the bank, you know. The bank not accountable to them. You know, your news on Friday night. If you do have fifty thousand dollars in a bank account, you're not getting no interest. And you see when you have fifty thousand interest in a, fifty thousand in a bank account, you know how much interest you are getting at the end of the year. Give me a guess. Seven hundred dollar interest for fifty thousand dollars. They are not accountable to the people that we have shares in the bank. But our organization, whether it's a business or it's a political organization, it must be accountable to the members. Therefore, the members have to be more and more educated that they can hold we to account. I hear me now. We're not afraid of no economic, no political challenge, no security challenge. No security challenge we're not afraid of. We work upon them and detect them and make ourselves aware of all security threat, economic threat, political threat. And then now we develop international links with the African diaspora. That's sentimental enough. Business link and international link. And educational challenge we're going to deal with that. We're going to beg them. Run it to the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Education of the labor rights also refuse to make history a compulsory subject. They know why they refuse to make history a compulsory subject. We have to do it. We have big government to do nothing. Pinnacle. They want to take Pinnacle and turn like Liberty Hall now. They want to take Pinnacle and turn a, a government institution where you get permission to come keep me now. We're not supposed to get no permission to keep me there. But if the UNI was being run properly, hear this now, hear this. If the UNI was being run properly, we could have fight and make sure that this hand over to the UNI here. But the UNI here right now not run properly. And some dominant personnel that control it. But when they are subject to the membership, we can hand back over yes to the UNI. But no one personnel to come dominate. Nothing. All right, Jerry, one, more, you know? one more minute in the introduction. Planning. A planning and policy we're dealing with. And that brings success in our life. Planning and policy. Yeah. Your plan work, and your work to plan and stop joking around. All right, thank you very much, Jerry Small. And... Once again, as, a, as we do have an attorney at law here who will represent us at the Broadcasting Commission meeting, <laughs> we apologize uh, for the uh, profanity and hope that we didn't offend anybody. We know that that is totally against the regulations of the Broadcasting Commission and could uh, uh, cause us some serious fines. But um, Bert Samuel is right here. Go ahead, Bert. Yes, as we say, we continue to speak 100 years after the formation of the UNIA. We're proud to say that there are some achievements we're proud of other achievements we are frowning on. For example, we still have a court system where every morning we get up and say, God save the Queen of England. It's not a shame 100 years. The people come to court and before they can get justice, they are formed the view that it has to be through the Queen of England, who's 
ancestors enslaved us. So that is a big, big drawback. I don't think that Marcus and the spirit of Marcus is proud to know that we still have a system in Jamaica where that operates. Over to your brother, Lorne, as we speak of the judicial system and the social political status of black people 100 years after the formation of UNIA. The microphone again. Yes, sir. Greetings and blessings, brothers and sisters. Give thanks to be here. I just want us to, in our minds, to remember Brother Tony Martin. Brother Tony Martin, one of the foremost Marcus Garvey scholar, who has, who recently passed away in Trinidad, but who has left unto us a great volume of works that has helped to heighten our education surrounding the Honorable Marcus Garvey. So I just want us to give a big round of applause for Tony Martin who really has done wonders for us. Socio-political with regards to the UNIA. The Honorable Marcus Garvey, as you all know, was a printer and as you all know, he led a printer's strike at the government printery, something that cost him to lose his job. But the loss of his job, he then went and joined his real first political organization was the National Club. This was an organization that he helped to form at the age of 21. And the core of this club was betterment for the workers, strong anti-colonialism, and strong movement towards political independence. This is at age 21, you know, when he formed that club. Shortly after he left, by 1910, when he went across to Central America, Costa Rica, Panama, and those countries, came back to Jamaica, then by 1912, he went over to Europe, to England and these places. He came back to Jamaica from England on the 15th of July, 1914. And five days later, he formed the UNIA, the Universal Negro Improvement Association. Why did I give that little background? Uh, many of you will know it in even more detail than I have just mentioned it. But to show the build-up, the build-up of the Honorable Marcus Garvey towards forming this great and outstanding organization. Having led strikes, having participated in movements, having traveled abroad, he now felt that he had reached a certain level that he had to launch the UNIA. The UNIA, brothers and sisters, in my view, almost everything about it was political. Not political in a divisive sense of PNP and JLP, but political. When you talk about nationhood, when you talk about government, just imagine in 1914, only two or three African countries were independent then. So when he was speaking about government, when he was speaking about, he made it quite clear. He says, look, the UNIA is different from all the other black organizations around the world. He says it is different from all the other black organizations in America. And he gave us a reason why he said it was different. He says all these other organizations are talking about black people being subservient to other governments. He says if you continue to agitate in America, you're agitating to a level. You will never go beyond that level. And Garvey was saying that we must be at the pinnacle of our existence upon this earth. So what we found in America the same way he was working, you had an organization made up of some of the black intellectuals and so on saying, Marcus Mark Garvey must go home. So they were planning 
how to get him to be deported so as to deflate some of his work that he was using the United States for. All right, Miguel, just a, a so, minute in the, in the introduction so that yes. we can get through it. Give thanks. So, brothers and sisters, let us think now as we move on today and onward. How can we, we... We cannot welcome the head of the IMF and be glad. That is contrary to the principles of Marcus Garvey. Give thanks. Thank you very much, Miguel Lohan. And by way of introduction, uh, a man who has not been a stranger, no stranger to putting forward the African position in his own way. We welcome, and as another panelist who will give his introductory statement, Muta Baruka is a renowned dub poet, Pan-Africanist, and talk show host. Yeah, good morning. Good morning, listeners out there. You know, I want to take it upon the next, a different part, and start with the CARICOM. You know, CARICOM was supposed to galvanize this part of the world what I'm calling the West Indies or the Caribbean of people of like minds and understanding and how to forge a, a social and political art and structure. But because the people them are the leaders who was forming this structure had no Pan-African agenda but, all, but what they had was a the same European connections. So most of their philosophy and logics was stemmed around how to facilitate this European idea in order to free and liberate the Caribbean people, not recognizing the social structure of the Caribbean, which was African. Now we see 100 years has passed, Marcus Garvey, and we still now have to talk about Marcus Garvey, and how we as a people now must he either forced the leaders of the Caribbean area to recognize how important it is to appreciate the racial structure of the Caribbean and move outside of the European connection and move toward a South-South connection with Africa. Because this is the only redemptive element that we have right now standing. The, uh, the EU has forged a connection with themselves. We say they have a thing here, brick. Started out as brick, now it's bricks. Because bricks now, the S in it is really South Africa. And South Africa economy is not again centered around the American structure, but at the Chinese structure, which is strange. Because what happens is that you have Brazil, which has the most black people outside of Africa. You have India, and you have Russia, which is very, right now we see them in some tackle with America again and you have now you have China and South Africa farming this what would be in Jamaica or in the Caribbean called CARICOM. I feel that right now we can start again in terms of developing a, a racial identity for the Caribbean and we hear um, Steve Golden refer to the reality of the, 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 the structure. We keep talking about color continuously and not talking about the race. CARICOM is more African than any other thing in the Caribbean. And we must organize around race because it is the race that is defining us and it is the race that is causing us to be in such a strange and precarious position with economic, social, and political orders. So I am seeing that the leaders, because they say the people lead, the leaders will follow. I am seeing that the people must organize around a racial structure in order to get these intellectuals and PhD leaders to understand that if you don't have a, 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 a African logics, deciding your social, political, and religious structure. You will not go anywhere. You will continue to face the Americanization of your country. You will continue to face the economical structure that is barring Jamaican from developing their economic status by telling us that IMF and they, that when we say that IMF has not done any good for any country, they start to refer to what look on Europe. They, the problems of Europe and how they structure Europe 
full fast examination is not the same as how they put on third world countries. And we have to understand that. The IMF, um, what, what they call, um, conditions, the IMF conditions in third world countries is not the same conditions in European countries. So we cannot look on Greece and all these countries that have taken money from the IMF and say, but see them there, they move forward. Because it is not the same thing. The IMF structure is designed to make third world countries feel and be dependent on them forever and ever. We as Jamaican people and Caricom people, I want to say Caricom people, I'm talking about all the Caribbean, including Trinidad, that have a majority of Indians there. Because it's the same problem them. they have. We as Caricom people must recognize that there now is the time, now is the time and its 100th anniversary to seek a different course and a different direction in our political and social and economic structure and move towards developing a, a pan-African connection, a racial connection. Because even in West Africa... A minute, a minute, 30 it, seconds. Eh? 30 seconds. Yeah, even in West Africa now, the Western African countries is setting themselves outside of the European connection. The AU is setting themselves even though almost paralyzed by Obama and the regime, it's setting themselves to move away from the European structure. We as Caribbean people must recognize our ability in history and how we shape ourselves in history in relationship to our connection with Africa in this Thank time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mucho Baruka. Thank you. All right, the discussion will continue after we have had all the opening statements two to go, uh, Dr. Amani Safara Amma. Well, I want to thank you, Sister Kabu Ma'at Keru and IRFM for this opportunity to participate in the State of the Race think tank. And I am sure that Garvey would be proud of this initiative because he said of the media, the function of the press is public service without prejudice or partiality and to convey the truth as it is seen and understood without favoritism or bias. And I think you do that very well on this forum every week. And of course, I'm one of your most faithful uh, <laughs> listeners. And Thank you very uh, much, I, I really think it is time that we, you know, take an unapologetic approach to how we do media in Jamaica because if we shilly shally and, 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 and try to do the politically correct thing, we'll always be in denial of who we are. And I think this problem of our identity politics is central to what we have to think about in considering the state of the race because politically we are more precarious than we were a hundred years ago, in my opinion, when Garvey was carving out so many uh, pillars, so many models that we have to our uh, uh, disadvantage uh, disregarded over the years. And I think our political vulnerability is nowhere more evident than on one of the films that is shown right here at Liberty Hall, because I always uh, take my students here uh, to see what Garvey was able to do over a hundred years ago with nothing that we have. He didn't have Instagram and Facebook and the internet and uh, how many Androids and tablets and whatever that we have at our disposal. And he was still able to galvanize a kind of political fervor and passion that I think we are, we're missing today. So that notion of Oh, who we are and, and, and how we leverage our identity to uh, make us, you know, find advantage as a people. I think we are missing the boat when we fail to put that at the center of our political economy and, and that kind of thing. And, and what Garvey had to say about this was that so many of us find excuses to get out of the Negro, and of course we'd say African in this time, the Negro race, because we are led to believe that the race is unworthy and that it has not accomplished anything. Cowards that we are. It is we who are unworthy, Garvey said, because we are not contributing to the uplift and the upbuilding of this noble race. How dare anyone tell us that Africa cannot be redeemed when we have 
400 million men and women with warm blood coursing through our veins. The power that holds Africa is not divine. The power that holds Africa is human. And it is recognized that whatsoever man and woman has done, man and woman can do. And I think that's our charge to identify what we can do to make our political uh, and, our, and our economic and our social mind you, our identity politics much more self-centered. Thank you very much, Dr. Imani Tafari Amma. Yes, and, we, and, and IRFM listeners, we want you to know that this is a great morning. It's a hundred years. Thank you very much, Dr. Imani Tafari Amma. Yes, and, we, and, and IRFM listeners, we want you to know that this is a great morning. It's a hundred years to the day, the 20th of July, that we are here to celebrate. And let us not forget that when they decided to make the flag of Jamaica in 1962, they put black in it and had a negative connotation about the suffering of the people. Let us compare that with when the Ghanaian flag was being made and Nkrumah, the Honorable Nkrumah, decided to put the black star line in the middle of the, uh, the Ghanaian flag in honor of Marcus Garvey. We have done not enough to recognize Garvey in our own country. A prophet seemed not to be honored in his own land. At this time, the final panelist is Dr. Arthur Green, medical doctor, author and founder of African Liberation Movement, will speak and introduce his views of this social political status uh, 100 years after UNIA. Yes, Asante Sana, thank you very much. Ujamba Wote, greetings to the people. Habari, Ghani, greetings to the people. Today, a hundred years since the founding of the UNIA ACL, in the name of all the ancestors and Garvey, we will speak the truth as given to us by history without reservation and without fear of the consequences. We are in a state where we are like the people moving with the emperor and the empress that were stark naked. And we were pretending as if they were wearing fine woven linen. And that little child said, look, they are naked. And that is where we find ourselves today. We have to face the truth. Socio means what is, this, what is our state. Many of us are here without even a cup of tea from morning. And it goes right through the country. So the social condition of the country is that we find ourselves in a state of poverty. Not only pecuniary poverty. Poverty in terms of literacy, culturally and in every other form. Spiritually, scientifically. Politically, politics only means that persons who are there to determine the policies that should be in our own best interest. This is not the case today. Now, Garvey posed a question like this almost a hundred years ago, and when he looked at that time, he said, the race, the black race is in a state of confusion. Practically, without any unity of purpose or common objective. Now, Garvey's observations still remain today, and that is a challenge that we face. First of all, we have a problem of identity. And if we at this stage cannot identify ourselves, then we are in serious problem, because what has been foisted upon us is what is known as multiculturalism. So the Chinese who is born here in Jamaica has no problem by saying, I am Chinese. The Indians have no problem in saying, I am Indian, and we admire that. But when it comes to us as Africans, we now claim that we are Jamaicans. Now this is madness. And in the last 52 years, 52 years of changing from one regime to the other. It's like flipping a coin with the two sides, head and tail. We are going nowhere. And we are not here to criticize them. What we are saying, Garvey was a man of critical thinking. Therefore, the challenge to us is to think and unite, find ourselves common objective and purpose around which we can rally and form a third force 
we should be acting in our own best interest. All right, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Arthur Green. No, as the, the crowd continues to go here, it's, it's, well, it looks like it might be standing room only. Are we seeing that now uh, in the, the center here at Liberty Hall? The drumming is continuing uh, in the ground, the grounds of Liberty Hall in the yard where Profi and the Nyabingi drummers have been drumming continuously throughout the night. And uh, you can hear that thumping in the background. We're a little, bit dis a little way off from it, but they have been drumming uh, all night. We are coming to you live. It is an important occasion. It is 100 years since Marcus Moalemu, Marcus Messiah Garvey founded the UNIA and ACL. Our question this morning, what is the state of the race 100 years later? Should we be concerned? Should we be optimistic? How do we move forward? My co-moderator in this segment is Bert Samuels. Bert, we're going to go for a quick break, come right back and go into the discussions. Optical Elements has the latest technology lenses and frames to suit your taste and budget. Visit us at 67 Halfway Tree Road, online at OpticalElementsJA.com or call 929-8284. Optical Elements, vision in style. The time by Optical Elements is... Now five minutes after eight o'clock. It's the Africa Forum, Running African, coming live from Liberty Hall in Kingston, 76 King Street. Turn it over to my co-moderator, Pan-Africanist, lawyer, attorney at law, uh, Bert Samuels, as we continue this discussion. Bert, just before you do that, we are running behind time in terms of times, so we're going to ask you to make your comments as short as you possibly can. Yes, and greetings, IRFM listeners. Let us not forget that McGarvey's movement is the main newspaper in Jamaica, said the Garvey movement was one to be nipped in the bud. When he went to the United States, the FBI searched him. They put spies among the Garvey groups, and persons were reporting to the FBI on Garvey. And therefore, the ancestors are pleased that they, though there were attempts to kill the movement, 100 years, the children, the ancestors' children are here to celebrate the ideas and thoughts of Marcus Garvey. We give thanks to the ancestors and the spirit of the ancestors. Yes, because we know that children will rise up. And he said that he would come in the whirlwind. We represent that whirlwind this morning of 100 years the whirlwind has returned to the King Street location of Liberty Hall. We therefore, I open the floor again back to the panelists. We're going to invite Brother Lauren to continue his line along the social political status 100 years after the formation of UNIA. And then, and Miguel, just before you, and you, 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 you do that, if you could also include in that, and, be, uh, and we asked Muta to pick up right after you're through, um, the idea that Muta posited about um, the role of CARICOM in the political structure of, as we go ahead, as we go forward. Right. Let's go ahead. Um, yes. Um, one thing Brother Muta has said, which I think we need to move away from, he says that we need to pressure the leaders so that they start to carry out some of the things that are necessary. I, I really, and our group, we have passed that stage now of asking the leaders to do these things. For years, you know, I was part of many groups that marched to Jamaica House, King's House, House of Parliament, asking them. In other words, brothers and sisters, I want us to start to think now that we here now must become the leaders. That is the only time. And I say it with all seriousness, brothers and sisters. When I look around and I see so much brilliant minds here this morning, yet the Marcus Garvey People's Political Party have difficulty fielding 63 solid candidates. We shouldn't have that problem. But we have become so afraid that when you step out now and say we must become the political leaders, we can occupy all the seats in the House of Parliament. Our own brothers and sisters ask if we're mad. Our own brothers and sisters say we're not for business in our politics. Almost everything we do is part of the political structure. So, you know, instead of us celebrating, a lot of people come and they were so glad they said, boy, Time Magazine said, Bob Marley's man of the year. This one said, Bob Marley's this of the year, and so on. And I have to keep reminding them, what did the Honorable Marcus Garvey tell us? Be not quick to take a title from another race. 
they are camouflaging you before your brother, before your very face. Don't let them be our standard. We must understand ourselves. Marcus Garvey's first newspaper, the name of it was Our Own. When he set up the National Club, the first newspaper, Our Own. You know what that means? We must start think that we can do it for ourselves, brothers and sisters, at every level. And to point out further, recently, the Marcus Garvey People's Political Party, we had a, a, a conference over in Broadleaf in Manchester, and the organization vote to restart the Marcus Garvey newspaper and to name it Sankofa. You know, Sankofa says, you, 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 you look back so as to be able to go forward with greater purpose and mission. Give thanks. All right, and uh, Moja, if you could develop on the point you made earlier in terms of the role of CARICOM, because you talked about, um, you know, South-South cooperation, and this is where we need to be going now. How do we get there, and what, is, what do you think, in your own opinion, is holding us back from that? Yeah, um, first, people power don't negate pressure on the present system. You know, so when we talk about pressure in the system, which we are not a part of now, it don't mean that in the interim we don't go into a level of trying to do a different thing from what the system is. You know, there's a thin line between we and them. 30 years ago, the same people who govern us now, 30 years ago, I was told that we must make not me, but we are going to make an effort for the young people who is coming up. These are the same people 30 years ago saying this. 30 years after, is the same people them saying, 30 years from now, we must help the youth them. When they said that 30 years ago, I was a youth. <laughs> so we have a problem with we and them not recognizing that we really don't know we and them are going to work it out because we and them don't negate all of we at all. So, the CARICOM thing that I speak about is not that we are looking on present government or present people in power to deal with it, but we must make a vision. If we should be able to make Miguel be the Prime Minister, we are saying that even though we understand where Miguel is coming from, but we must also realize that there is a system right now that we need to pressure. And I, my thing is that if, if we are to make certain changes, we can't say those people can't do nothing for we. I can't look for people if they do nothing for me, you know. I just have to say that them dead if they do something. My road won't fix. I never take up 100 man to go fix no road. And the government must fix that. I never make no man tell me in my table, say, well, all right, no, the road won't fix. Why we not 50%? Because the government now fix it. It's them must do it. And what we're doing now is, is taking where they, they, what, the pe what the government is supposed to do and put it in the people them and when they, what is the purpose of paying taxes to these people? If we, have a, if, if we every time water pipe, but we have to go fix the pipe. And then the government don't fix the pipe and we have to put we have to do it. Then I just have to just go and throw up wire up and wire and get electricity then. <laughs> All right, because we have to do that. So my CARICOM argument is this, that there's a system that is there now. The EU is a system. The AU is a system. BRICS is a system. All of these is a system. And we as black people over this part of the world must recognize that it's time to divert our attention from America, from Europe, and deal with the African connection. The African connection is the basis where Marcus Garvey did that talk about. Marcus Garvey, greatest power I've had was the black star liner. And this is an example of how we should have taken it. And he must say, Africa. One time, because Uncle Rasta said that, no, we are saying that most ones, no, a lot of ones are looking for a Pan-African perspective. We must not lose sight of the Pan-African perspective. And we must pressure these people to recognize that, look here, Africa, 
Is where the thing lie, all right, just or no? Let me just it's not throw, Europe. Let me throw it to, to, to Jerry, because Jerry, you know, one of the phrases you use all the time, which I, 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 I um, talk about myself on my own program, which is a critical mass, and you talk about leadership and how leadership is viewed, uh, not just in Jamaica, but wherever we are as black people. Is this also a fundamental uh, issue that we have to deal with in terms of how we, we view leaders and leadership? Yeah. And gaining that critical mass for change, your microphone. No, um, you have to prove yourself trustworthy <clears throat> before you can get on a political momentum. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of no Rasta bread and no Rasta sister. I'm not afraid of no Muslim. No one I'm afraid of. They're no bad man still in them. You have to prove yourself trustworthy before you can get on a political momentum anywhere in the world. And I don't want to talk about myself no more. I have no links with no GLP and no PNP. I don't have no obligation to post a Simpson Miller. Peter Phillips is a good British. I have no links, no obligation to him. No one in a labor right or no way. My obligation and links is with the African people and the other people in commerce, but the Chinese and the everybody. You have to prove yourself trustworthy, not me enough. All of us, many of us. Because if you're going to gain political traction in this country, and we will do so, it's numerous individuals are we. We yes. prove ourselves politically, not only political, we prove ourselves trustworthy. People who come from community all over Jamaica. All over the diaspora, we prove yourself politically trustworthy in the different places where we come from and where we are familiar. And then people moving together, not to the critical mass. You know. Critical mass is always a minority, you know. but it's enough to move everything. If you're not politically trustworthy, if you're not personally trustworthy, you're not getting no momentum. Why the people, hold on, why the people's political party? How come there's no cooperation between the people's political party and the, and the so called UNIA? Because why? some personality, when you're accountable to no member, or some personality who have some status and beliefs that them status can carry them. But you have to choose, you have to find yourself trustworthy. Right, Jerry, we have... Many of you all both link up, doing business with one another, playing football with one another, on a picnic and marry one another. Are you, are you trustworthy? They will going to gather some momentum in this country and all over the world. No personality. All right, we have representatives well, on well, both. Well, 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 no, you need a microphone. No, pers no personality. Now, but dominate the African people. You're back with your personality. All right, right. holy right. day, Jerry. Holy day, Jerry. Who's going to dominate? Ideas going to lead. No what? personality. We don't have no obligation to no Porsche, no Andrew Wallace. No JLP, we're no gonna, JLP, none of them. We're going to segue we from that. Friends. We're going to segue from that, Jerry, as you talk about Stop ideas. As Jerry talks about ideas and the fact that ideas will rule. I mean, this is the point you made earlier, uh, Dr. Imani Tapai Ama. I think this is where you also went in terms of ideas and that ideas will, will rule. How do we get there, though? Because I seem to, to me, it appears as if the ideas are, you know, floating around there in many different areas. I mean, look at this table, and all of us at one time or the other have hosted all kinds of programs, all kinds of events, and we have participated in many different fora and you know symposium and so on but at the same time we we keep talking about the same ideas Stephen Golding talked about it this morning we haven't come far enough from 100 years ago in terms of where we need to be how do we politically your own views bearing in mind what we heard about CARICOM ideas leadership and so on how do we politically move this agenda of African liberation forward even after we leave here today well you know we can't do the politics without the economics and and what amazes me about Marcus Garvey is that no matter which topic you'd like to think about. He always had a, a, a something to say about that. You could always have a quotation from Marcus Garvey, no matter what political, ideological, social, or, or even gender, for that matter, perspective that you wanted to come from. And he talked about preparedness. And I think we are woefully unprepared for the magnitude of the, the task that lies ahead of us. And it's, it's, it's shameful because of 
you know, the, the roadmaps, the, the various models that Garvey already um, left blueprints for us to, 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 to look at, to, 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 to model and to follow. And I think, you know, this the vision that we keep talking about amongst ourselves, the, the Willilin syndrome where we don't trust each other and we don't see beyond the, the, the tricks and, 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 and the, the matches box and, and whatever is in business. We, we need to find a more... Uh, wholesome, holistic, pattern, spiritual way of, of, of doing leadership, of doing governance, of doing economics, so that we, we can be more uh, prepared for, for doing the, 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 the politics and, and the governance that we find at, at our... In fact, Muta Baruka referred to the fact that 30 years ago we were the youth. And the fact that we find ourselves more in the elder category now is something also frightening because the passage of time is very swift when it comes to how it is that we're going to do the transformation that we need to do. And if we don't get this act together very quickly, we will be the... Yes, elder, elder in a very, very short space of time and right, we don't me, have time to, me, to get that preparedness done. And, and we are running out of time also, but let me throw it to Dr. Arthur Green in terms of what, how we move forward. Um, we all know that there is something to be done. You talked about it, you say the emperor is naked. But how do we now clothe the emperor, I take it out, put it down, call it what it is, and then diagnose it in other words. As a medical doctor yourself, you know how this works. There has to be a diagnosis for treatment. So we have diagnosed the problem or have we? And how do we treat it? Yeah, the solution, we have several solutions, but, um, you know, Garvey, in his dialogues from the black man, poses him the question to himself, and he says, really, what is the difference? Why are the other races progressing, and where, why are we lagging behind? You realize he talked about unity, and he talked about the state of mind. The mental state and critical thinking is what is going to get us out of the problem in which we are. And we don't want it to be just theoretical. Let us deal with the practical. The libraries of this country are still free. Encourage the children to go on to the library during the holidays. Go to the library and read. In the classrooms, the children who are good at a certain subject, if one child is good at maths, he can help the other one who is not so proficient at it. So simple things are there that we can use and going on. Now, at this point in time, we must realize that we are also find ourselves in a state of mental paralysis. And that is where the church comes in with the state. The church comes in with the state. And if anybody should tell you that it's a blessing to be poor, then such a one should be sent to Bellevue immediately. The only thing that poverty brings us is misery. And we have no reason to be poor in this small country of 2.7 million people. Now, Garvey told us about economics. And what is in the air is now the whole legalization of marijuana. And if this is one of the avenues besides tourism, that will help to liberate us economically, then by all means, let us unite around it in the legal way and seize it to bring ourselves out of poverty. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Arthur Green. Of course, uh, you know, the, as we said earlier, all these areas that we're looking at, these subgroups, are, but they are connected. Uh, we talk about education, you have to talk about the politics, the socio-political situation. You talk about that, you have to talk about the socio-economic situation. And of course, security at the very top of the list, too, in terms of how we move forward as a race. Muta, can you bring this, this segment of the discussion um, together, pull it together, with um, how you yourself see us going forward um, politically. I understand the role of CARICOM. I understand what, you know, the connection you're making um, to the BRICS and so on, with South Africa in the BRICS. But uh, this aside, wherever we are as black people, politically, we are at the bottom of the, uh, uh, the, the wrong uh, uh, of a ladder. How do we pull ourselves up by our bootstrings from there, if we have to? Yeah, um... The media is one of the most effective
transmission of the people's consciousness and thinking. And I think that we don't reach a stage yet where we use the media to liberate the people's mind. I mean, we have programs that are doing it, but with 20 different radio stations playing the majority of the time music that don't even have no consciousness in it. It's really a warped mentality that perpetuates this, this degradation on the minds of the people. So when we hear about media, I am seeing that we should use the media more effective for change. That is the purpose of it right now. I mean, we understand both other things and entertainment. I'm not negating entertainment, but we're reaching our crisis now. We are at war. And we have to study the art of that war and how we're going to use it to liberate ourselves. And if we don't, say, the media, take, the, take the, 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 the space of the guns and the bombs now, or even tying a bomb by yourself. The media is more effective. Them used to tell you to pen mighty than the sword. I would see that. Men who create war don't go to war. Them right. So I am seeing that Miguel, um, Jerry, and, and, and the sister, all everybody who have a microphone in front of them, every time, most of the time, should use that to liberate the minds of the people. All right, thank you very much, Mojo. Thank you very much. As we bring this segment uh, to a wrap, let me just quickly remind you, uh, this morning we dedicated this program in a way to, 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 to the ancestors, to those upon whose shoulders we stand. And then we identified two persons who are still living and, and, and um, talked about them starting a black think tank, uh, Dr. Julia here and Dr. Nathan here. And one of the things that they talk about is the idea of black leadership as opposed to leading blacks. And they have pointed to the idea of leading blacks as being one of uh, the bane of the African existence. In that a, 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 an African becomes successful, but it, it's not, uh, one, one, one author uh, talks about, you know, only the black woman can say when and where I enter. Because as you enter, there the entire race enters with you. But I'm not quite sure that we have bought into this concept of when we enter, we're carrying a race with us. And so they talk about black leadership as opposed to leading blacks. And I think that has a place where we talk about our own political advancement, whether we are leading blacks in politics or we are studying and acting within the idea of Mwali Mo Marcus Mosiah Garvey of black leadership. Yes, we, we, we just want to remember that, you know, Marcus Garvey founded the largest black movement in history. A country boy coming to Kingston at age 14 had to leave school because he had to support his parents. All those things were drawbacks, but Marcus built on his own belief in his race. We want to give thanks to the ancestors that, you know, a son who came here in the bowels of a ship has brought a nation to where it is today. And we want to make sure that we bring it forward. We can't forget Walt, the Honorable Walter Rodney, who when he sought to Ghana and go into Rastafarian community, and he left the island to come back, the government, the government at the time stopped him at the airport and didn't allow him to come back into the country. We can't forget and we can't be naive about those who have sought to get black unity, political unity, what they will do to you. They tried it with Marcus, they tried it with Honorable Ma um, Walter Rodney, and we know that we can't be naive when we are saying we need black leadership. Thank you very much. And we have to do this, pardon me, because we are broadcasting live on the 107s and we are also streaming live on the internet. So we do have to do this that I'm about to do now. Listen up. Top draws, dollars, pick two, pick three, pick four, cash pot, and the early bird draws are up next. We're going to side of the Africa Forum, Running African. We're coming to you live from Liberty Hall, the legacy of Mualimu, Marcus Mazaya Garvey. I'm sitting beside my very good friend, colleague, and brother right now, Muta Baruka. Muta, welcome back from Africa. Welcome forward. Uh, you've been to Gambia, Ghana, Senegal. And Ni so on. Nigeria. 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 And here you are. Well, quickly, because we're going to go into news, and you're leading this segment, which is about 10 or so minutes, which we're taking questions from the audience. And so. And, and so yeah. All right, Nicholas. Um, all right. We, are, we, are, we are here again. So, if you can just pay attention to what's going on up here, we're talking about the people them inside Liberty. We're not talking about the people them out there. 
But um, we're going to have a question and answer section with the panelists them that is here now. Um, attention, we can't deal with the attention thing. I know personal talking are going on, so we want all the questions them directed to the ones them at the table, especially about what has transpired since the the panel thing starts. So if there's any question out there, someone can put up them on and be courteous about it. Put up your hand and ask a question. We don't want a statement. Uh, go ahead, my sister. Yes. Morning. Morning to all the panel. Morning. Greetings. Greetings. Now, I would like to ask a question because Andrea asked this question, I think maybe about five or six years ago, about our black people. Now, up until then, I really don't really hear the answer of the black people. Now, I want to give this black people a ABC teaching. No, we are oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. They can't hear teaching, no, no, the question. Yeah, just a minute, just a minute. Just no, but it's a question I want to ask. It's a question I want to ask. The no, question no I would ask is, how would you prepare a black people so that they can stand up in honor and dignity? All right, thank you very much. Anybody at the table wants to take that? Um, Jerry? Ladies now, uh, most of the people here have advice through the media. Brother Becky, they invite him from the media otherwise, so he's been doing some program, still have a voice from here, Dr. Green. It is our duty here to make our people know, say, you have to stop shy at talk about you know, in, you know, business with politics. We're not business with JLP and PNP. But to be with our representation and we must start drum that in our brethren sister. Tell you what, man stop afraid of them Rasta brethren and Rasta sister. I say, you are a politician, but we are the, we are the whole Rasta. So, you understand, there's a little tendency to say, well then, if you are talking about political representation, it's a lower farm animal, a joke in the neck. I listen to the farm, the OAU. And when I farm the OAU, I say, if come and Jamaica and say, when I found the way, when we found the way, I made special requests that Jamaica must be, can become a member of OAU and have political representation in there. But if we stop shy to talk about them things there. And All right. Because if we shy to talk about that, you have to look to Portia Simpson Miller and Andrew Wallace. All right, thank Rose you. Rose Golden and PJ Pass. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah, question. Yeah, on the question of identity. And I'll still go on the idea. Yeah. 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 Do we really want better conditions under the colonial order or do we want to be full free? Because uh, the position here that most of us run here don't want to be really full free. They want to align themselves under the order. And Existing. other person like myself don't like that. I want to be full free, so All right, we, we heard, want to set up the party. We heard your question loud and clear, my brother. Miguel, brother Miguel, you want to take that one? No, as he said. Microphone? Yes. As he said, that about full free. The book I'm reading now, which I just brought along, the, 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 the title of this book is Freedom to the Free. In other words, even after people were freed, um, in the United States, they realize a hundred years later, the president realized a hundred years later, that they had no freedom. So he commissioned a group to look into why it is that even after emancipation in America, a hundred years later, the, the freed did not have freedom. And that's what I think he's gearing at in terms of freedom to be free. Um, or full free. Looking here, and looking at this group now, and I said to myself, I would take it, one, that all of us here in this room supports the UNIA. That we support and we would want to see continue the Marcus Garvey movement of the UNIA. Am I correct in that view? Right. So, brothers and sisters, if we can all join because one way of fulfilling our mission 
is that we look, having joined the organization, you look at the objectives of the organization and we work towards those objectives and in my view, we would be fulfilling the mission of the Honorable Marcus Garvey. Uh, Mucha, I think thanks. we can take only one more question. I think we can take one more question. Okay. Greetings. What are we doing about the state of the plastic in our environment as we move forward in this day and age? Um, um, plastic is all around and as it is contributing to, to the environment in a negative all right. light. All right, we're hearing your question, Sister. There's a medical doctor on the panel, Dr. Arthur Green. Uh, do you want to take that question quickly? You have just a minute to answer before we go into news and sports. Yes, yes, um, um, Sister. Plastic may be useful, but it is very harmful to the environment. The environment as it is is being polluted because the half-life of a lot of these materials is decades, sometimes even hundreds of years before they are, the earth is able to consume them. So what we have to do is to start in our community by collecting these things and also for, uh, forcing the agencies to recycle them. Right, so it's about education, educating the youth and the community in general that these things are not to be used willingly to pollute the shores the oceans and the earth, the soil, but that we should use them, collect them, and recycle them. That's yes, sir. Yes, um, and you, you know that we still need to educate the mass of the people about the difference between plastic and rubbish. You understand? Because we keep mixing up the whole of them and then dump the whole of them and burn it and then we create problem. Anyway, next question. One more question. Quick question. question. Yes. Yeah, give thanks, Majesty. I have two questions. The first one is... One quick question. How quickly. do you... When are we as a people going to have a media, as you say, the media is very important, a radio station which is fully um, levocated to deal with the black liberation all right uh, Musha, you want to answer that yeah when we can collect the money <laughs> from like the nyabingi councils and the different organizations that shop to liberate the people and if we can galvanize the money and we just that sing a song say where the boat where the money there you know if we can get all the money there together so as a man negos as a man who Manipulate the, the networkings and things. Maybe you can't really galvanize some people to deal with that. You know? Well, Bob Hunter, on Twitter, I think it is, says, I would like to know of the bank account of the organization in which funds can be sent to support the cause and political campaign. Okay. So um, that's Bob Hunter. All right, we have to go to news and sports, and we come right back to look at the security status of the race 100 years after. And then right after that, we'll be looking at the socioeconomic status we see from the Jamaica National Heritage Trust, Chairman Ainsley Henriquez has joined us and uh, he will be on the panel looking at the socio-economic status. Say hello also to my very good friend from the University of the West Indies, Dr. Tunde Biwaji in the house. Back to you Shane for news and sports. Good morning, I am Nikita Sterling with the local and international headlines. Five people who police say are affiliated to the Up and Live gang that operates out of Crookspen, Eldersley, St. Elizabeth, have been arrested and charged. They have been accused of being involved in lottery scamming and other criminal gang-related activities. Charged with breaches of the Law Reform Fraudulent Transactions Special Provisions Act are 29-year-old Stacian Bowen, 27-year-old Preston Bowen, 21-year-old Nicholas Mullings, 21-year-old Kenya Bryan, and a 16-year-old female. Report Side that a police team carried out an operation in the parish during which two flash drives, several sheets of paper containing names and addresses of individuals living overseas, along with several money transfer receipts, were found. A grey 2005 Honda CRV and several cellular phones were also seized in the operation. Police say the arrests are the latest in an ongoing crackdown against people involved in in gang-related activities.
Thieves broke into the Marnt Bay Seventh-day Adventist Church in St. Thomas Friday and made off with several appliances and equipment. The robbers reportedly took a microwave, several wall fans and microphones. Police theorized that the robbers gained access to the building through a damaged door, then removing a section of the grill. Church members have expressed outrage at the act and have called on the thieves to desist from stealing from the church. They say the equipment and appliances stolen are, stolen are used to enhance worship and other meetings at the church. The Jamaica Fire Brigades this week received three new trucks valued at $133 million. The units, which are designed to traverse the local terrain, are also capable of pumping water while being driven and are the first such units that will be used in Jamaica. They are also able to discharge water at a rate of over 700 grams per minute, built with air-conditioned cabins and equipped breathing apparatus. The units will be deployed in St. Andrew, Portmore, St. Catherine and Mapen Clarendon. In news overseas, Gaza has come under the most intense shelling since the launch of Israel's offensive, with more than 50 people reported killed in one district. Palestinian medics said the deaths occurred in Shajaya, east of the Gaza city. Eyewitnesses spoke of bodies lying in the streets. Finally, the remains of up to 160 people from the MH17 crash in Ukraine have been loaded onto refrigerated rail wagons to be taken to an unknown destination. Emergency workers said earlier that 196 bodies have been recovered from the area in rebel-controlled territory where the Malaysia Airlines jet came down. International monitors were informed that 169 bodies had been moved to the train in the nearby town of Torres. Those were the local and international headlines. News next at 11.45. From the IRFM Newsroom, I'm Nikita Sterling. That was news from IRFM, Jamaica's non-aligned news voice. The time is 8.50 a.m. 100 years after. Let me also welcome you on the internet at irfm.net. We are streaming live at the moment. And I don't know if you uh, were watching on the internet and Mark can indicate to me uh, as to whether or not those who are watching on the internet can actually see the crowd that is here because we are operating with uh, below, uh, below three cameras. But, <laughs> but you can still get an idea of what's with uh, below, uh, below three cameras. But... <laughs> <laughs> but you can still get an idea of what's happening here at Liberty Hall. We're into the final two segments. I want to welcome those who have just come in in terms of panelists. And uh, we see Minister Omar Davies, who we mentioned earlier. Uh, joining us uh, in the audience is going to be a member of the final panel looking at the socio-economic status of the race 100 years later. Also in the audience, the Reverend Dr. Marjorie Lewis who has joined us uh, for that discussion also, which will be co-hosted and co-moderated later on by Professor Rupert Lewis. My co-moderator in this segment is Stephen Golden, President of the UNIA. I'm throwing it over to you, Stephen. Thank you, Cabo. And let me just congratulate you and the IRFM team again for a wonderful forum today. The state of the black race 100 years after the founding of the UNIA and ACL. I want to begin this segment by drawing on a quote from Marcus Garvey that says, If we must have justice, we must be strong. If we must be strong, we must come together. 
And if it is that we must come together, we can only do so through the system of organization. As we look at the security status in terms of the state of the race, let us remember that the UNIA operated on the overarching principle of collective security. It is what strengthened the organization and allowed it to accomplish some of the great things that it did. A hundred years ago today, at that first meeting of the UNIA, which was between Marcus Garvey and Amy Ashwood, Amy Ashwood introduced the idea of having a ladies' division. And so every UNIA division had a male president and still does, has a ladies' lady president. So it shows the balance of the male and female energy, which goes a long way in terms of speaking about collective security. From that, the UNIA organized auxiliaries based on gender. The African Legions, which was the paramilitary arm, was for the training of young men in military skills and other skills. The Black Cross, which brought the women together to provide health services and, and relief in times of disaster to the community. The Motor Corps, which was for transportation, the movements, the goods and services, the Black Star Line, which was to be the Navy, as well as the juveniles, which provided for the education of our children. I say all of that to give an example of how the UNIA practiced this collective security using the strength of their mass to create auxiliaries and, and, and groups that would serve particular functions. Let's welcome the other panelists now. We have Bert Samuels, attorney at law, member of the National Commission on Reparations, Pan-Africanist. We have Muta Baruka back on this panel here, journalist, activist himself. There is also Patrick Beckford of the 12th Tribe of Israel and of course Brother Clive Mohammed, who is the leader of the Nation of Islam here in Jamaica. Welcome gentlemen as well as lady Sonia Harris, gender and social equity specialist, farmer and community organizer. Good morning Sonia. Can we start with the lady, ladies first? Um, in terms of security, the security status and the state of the race, a hundred years after the founding of the UNIA, where are we and how are we? Thank you very much for having me and for that question. I think a hundred years later, we are in a worse position in terms of our individual security and our collective security. The last time that we had a sense of ourselves as a nation, as a sovereign people, was in fact when the UNI was formed and for the 20 years of its operations after that. Since then, we've had sometimes in the 1960s, for example, the Black Power Movement, um, the Nation of Islam, the 1970s when we flirted with democratic socialism, we meaning the country of Jamaica. Um, the 1980s when Grenada flirted, I say flirted because these all failed, flirted with um, socialism. And it is interesting that the instruments that were formed were formed after all of these movements, after the UNIA, after the the weakening, really, of the Honorable Marcus Garvey, after the Black Power Movement, after Jamaica and Grenada, then they started to create new structures with some pretty names, like the Caribbean Basin Initiative, the Caribbean Basin Security Initiative, even the World Trade Organization, AFRICOM, and now the IMF. So these are actually not just sitting in Washington and saying, let's try to control the world. They are in response to the fact that black people can and do stand up for themselves as a nation. But in the last 30 years, I would say that our sense of sovereignty as a people has been severely diminished. Even Peter Phillips agonized over this last year when he came to sign the first agreement with the IMF, he agonized over the loss of our sovereignty as a people, as a Jamaican people, and as an African people worldwide. We have more puppet governments than we have governments that stand up for the people. Our policymakers do not protect us, they sign on the dotted line. These instruments that I mentioned are mostly designed in Washington and in Europe, and we are asked to sign on the dotted line. They're not designed in collaboration with us. So these instruments are, are the new structures to enslave us, and it is working. It is working because they come under the
the guise of trade, they come under the guise of security, but they're really protecting their own interests. And whose interests are we protecting? We are protecting their interests also. So we're selling out ourselves. Now, on the ground, there's always a level of consciousness and a movement for independent thought and independent action. The women, for example, in the 80s decided that they would not just become free zone workers. Some of them did, and some of them became members of the informal economy and began to travel the world with their trade. This shows the strength of our women. There are independent-minded women among us who will always find a way to act on behalf of their family and their community. All right, Sonia, we're going to pause it there as a, for your opening statement, and we're obviously going to come around again to uh, have the discussion. Uh, Bert Samuels is our next panelist. Yes, um, greetings again. I've changed rule, but I still one God, one aim, one destiny. <laughs> Marcus said that, whichever place you find me. Yes, and I think I've been, having been introduced as a member of the Reparations Commission of Jamaica, I have to also stick in this, the whole plan that reparations, we are due to the day after slavery. We were sent away from the cane fields. We were placed into no nothingness and poverty, driven to the worst parts of the lands in Jamaica. And we are now seeing on the Reparations Commission, which ties into Marcus Garvey's teachings and philosophy, that we should be paid for the time that we were in bondage in Jamaica, and we were impoverished. That is a big part of the Reparations Commission. And therefore, I have to, as a Pan-Africanist, tie all of that idea into the question of sovereignty, into the question of security, because as we know, there was much infiltration in every movement that there is progress, there's going to be infiltration. We know the role of the Central Intelligence Agency. Garvey felt the sting of the FBI when he was placed in prison and yet not yet even pardoned in Jamaica for a lot of what has happened. So we have to be conscious that whenever a system, whenever an organization is moving forward, those who want the old system to remain will always try to identify those among us who are trying to be leaders. And I said before, Walter Rodney was one such person. I think the time will come when we have a commission of inquiry into what caused the government of the time to have targeted Walt Rodney and ran him out of Jamaica. We know eventually that organization that didn't want Walter here killed him eventually in Guyana yes. because he was a spokesman on the part of the people. So our security is very important and we can't be naive about the forces that come against us if we try to liberate the people and have the people get what is due to them. Give thanks. Patrick Beckford, who represents the 12th tribe of Israel, your opening comment. Greetings. Greetings to the panel, my beloved sister Andrea Williams, to Steve, to all the rest up here. Greetings to the audience that is a mixed multitude, Rastafarians, um, Gaviites, ra you know, Rastafari. Um, greetings to the world because we are being heard all over. Greetings also to the 12 tribes of Israel that was scattered abroad and founded in Jamaica by our late departed prophet Brother Gad. Greetings also to our Lord and our Savior. Jesus Christ, who revealed himself to us in the personality of his Imperial Majesty, Emperor Haile Selassie I. I. Greetings also to the Ethiopian faith, which is not one of which no right, but rather a function of the heart, a mystical incorporation or unity in one, in, one, in plain words, to be born again. Greetings also to the Ethiopian royal family, and especially through His Imperial Highness Prince Zara Yaakov. It is indeed a pleasure to be 
a panelist on this forum that looks at links a hundred years of the right honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey and to examine in proper context the way forward where we have reached what is lacking and what needs to be done Marcus Garvey still to be honored in the real sense in let's talk of Jamaica where he was born the teachings of the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey should be taught in schools, all schools, as a prerequisite to enlarging, opening the minds of the youths coming in terms of their identity, their association with Africa, and the disassociation in terms of where you'd rather be in this world. Not Europe, not the United States of America, not Canada, etc., etc. Uh, I notice among the very young coming up now that the talk of Africa is still not at the forefront of their minds, of their imagination, of their school curriculum, of their social gathering. So it is important that we teach our children as parents the whole emphasis that here is this great person, Marcus Mosiah Garvey, who over the years said Africa for the Africans, those at home and those abroad. And of course, uh, Becky will build up on that point, uh, that point, those points later on in the, in the discussions. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, Clive, Brother Clive Mohammed is the um, representative of Minister Louis Farrakhan in Jamaica and also leader of the Nation of Islam here on the island. Brother Mohammed. Thank you. You can hear me now. Thank you for the invitation, sister. Honor and a privilege for you here today to be representing today. I bring you greetings on behalf of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Sister Andrea, thank you for being out front, being a warrior for the Cart Liberation. Muta as well, being a warrior and the, ca the Cart Liberation. From our people. You are, thank you, thank you. You are indeed a consistent voice. Brother Zaya, yeah. says me, speak about liberation of our people and as we talk about security I as a spiritual person knows that security comes first and foremost from the creator we cannot look to be secured in any way from anybody else except first and foremost from the creator our true security comes first and foremost from the creator i will begin by saying this we are looking for security every place else but where we should be looking we are looking for security from everywhere else but to whom we should be seeking security from security is a large word and a broad broad word no there is political insecurity in Jamaica. In Jamaica, our people are not secured politically, and neither do we feel secured politically. There is economic insecurity, because the masses of the people are crying out for food, clothing, and shelter, the basic necessities. So there is great insecurity with food, clothing, and shelter. 
politics, economics, the economic, the educational system. The educational system is not our own. The educational system is a colonial educational system. The political system is a colonial political system. We can take it or let it alone. We are dealing with actual facts. As Jamaicans, we know that we are a farmer colony. Are we a farmer colony or are we still colonialized? When we go into parliament, who do we give credence to? Queen Elizabeth, is that right? So the first thing that the first thing that we need to start doing is to free ourselves from colonialism from neo-colonialism, from political colonialism. Brothers and sisters, we cannot be a free people and have somebody from someplace else that we know is not one of us to come and tell us how to direct our lives, how to live our lives, how to spend our own money. Huh? We cannot be a free people and be thinking like that. So, as I've started out by saying, we have to free ourselves from cultural colonialism. All right, Brother Clive Mohammed, I want to leave it there so we can build up on it as we go ahead, as we go forward. Yes, because you have highlighted a few points that we want to come back and, and talk Thank about you. Thank as you. we throw it to uh, Tekla Mekfet. Educator, broadcaster, Pan Africanist, author. He joins us now on the panel also. But before we go to Tekla, let's Muta do his opening comment. Again. <laughs> yeah, greetings again. Um, you know, people tend to negate the idea of culture when they talk about security. Culture, all of the disciplines them that we talk about in our societies, whether it's social, political, economical, it stems from understanding culture and if we don't understand the culture of the people we can't secure the people and what we find is that the majority of politicians today don't tap into the culture of the people and we're not talking about music now and dancing we're talking about our heritage and an African-centered perspective, because the majority of people in Jamaica is, of Afri is African and majority of politicians don't use that Africanness to decide the security of the people. That is why now we're talking about growing food for export. We shouldn't be talking about growing food for export. We should have talked about growing food to secure Jamaican people. And what we, what we have over us, we export it. The problem is, the problem is, is that we try to satisfy foreign markets instead of securing the local market in every way possible. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mucho. Brother Tekla McFett, all name comments. Can you, can you hear? Okay. Can you hear me okay? All right, good. Well, I've come in right in the middle of things. I, I've been traveling all night. Um, I security is in I father. I father is the creator. I security is in what I come of, where I come of. I come of Ethiopia. I greet the one who greeted the expectation of the king. I greet Marcus Messiah Garvey, who knew that there was to be a king, and he would prepare in large measure the way for the king. Who is the king? Of the first land, of the first earth, Ethiopia, the whole world, the king, a way prepared by John the Baptist, Marcus Messiah Garvey. It is for this reason, we being the first people, and when things go wrong in the world, you go to your mother. The mother is Ethiopia. Africa. Africa. Yeah. 
And I want today to make a link between Marcus Garvey and the words of my father, Haile Selassie. Yes. But first of all, I would like to say something. I am most uncomfortable with the use of the word black. Yes, I'm African, I'm Ethiopian. Anytime you use the word black, there is a reference to white. As if you're taking your reference from that source. And it is in this very way, in your planning of economics and politics, all the structures, all the things in the universities. That's why I had great discomfort in university. Didn't you realize it, Rupert Lewis? Why I was so uncomfortable. It, they wanted you to speak in this strange language coming out of Princeton and Yale. To justify social sciences as a science. The only science I know is the logic of creation, the logic in nature, the logic in rhythm. And as I say all these things, you're identifying qualities of Rastafari. In Kingston. Thank you very much, Shane. Thank you very much. We are indeed coming to you live from Liberty Hall, the legacy of Moalamu Marcus Mosiah Garvey, my co-host in this segment as we discuss the state of the African race. And I do agree with Tekla Mekfet uh, on the use of the word. And I know that my brother Stephen Golding is going to be saying African in a minute to and not Negro. <laughs> Stephen, it's over to you. I agree with Tekla too, to the point that black is a color. And there are black people in this world who are not of our race. I would go with African, but unfortunately, Garvey said in 1939 that that word African had been hijacked. And so we have white South Africans now, and we have Arab North Africans who are defined legally in their own passport as Africans. So hence we stay with the word Negro, as Garvey said, the best word to define us. When you use that word, everybody knows exactly what you're talking about. I do want to open up with a question though, to, to, to our panelists, and in particular, Attorney at Law, Bert Samuels, on the issue of reparations. Um, because given our history here in the West, and we know how we were brought over the institutionalization of slavery, um, the Willie Lynch methods that were used to pit us against each other, how much this, this led to undermining our security as a race um, is something that needs to be examined. But in 1918, Marcus Garvey sent a petition to the newly formed League of Nations, 1918-1919, after Germany, having lost that first world war, were stripped of their African colonies. Gabi sent a petition asking that those colonies be returned to the race um, through the organization of the UNIA, which of course he was denied. In 1920, the UNIA held a conference that declared 52 rights of our race. Among those rights, which he advocated for, was um, the right to unlimited and unprejudiced education forever and the right to travel about the world unmolested. And he condemned those nations who made laws, immigration laws that restricted the movement of the African. He also said that as a race we have an inherent right to possess ourselves of Africa. I, I, I want to pose a question as to how much um, these actions and these strategies of Garvey are being examined by our reparations commission because if we're talking about reparations in terms of payment for services rendered, which we suppose is another way of shoring up our security. One of our greatest drawbacks is the economic state we find ourselves in as a race. How much are we considering um, these strategies of Garvey or are we just looking for a paycheck and how would that work? Because our race now has been so spread out. If we're dealing with governments of the Caribbean, for example, that does not necessarily represent the race. And the reparations argument is something I believe needs to be made on a racial basis, not on a geopolitical basis. Bert? Yeah, I think that's a good point that is being made. Because if we're walking the world with our hats in our hands, begging European countries who carved up uh, Africa in 1914 at the Berlin Conference, where they carved and gave Portugal a set of Africa, all over the place was carved up. And in the long run, we now are going back to the same Europe who, who colonized us, who raped our, our bauxite, who raped all the gold from West Africa, and then we are now become their beggars. It shows that the reparations must deal with the question of Garvey's teaching, that we can't have political independence until we have economic independence. And that economic independence is, comes collides with the interest of Europe, 
where we are have now to go to the IMF rather than to get being paid for our, our time that we were in slavery. The, the Germans have had to pay the Jews. The Japanese have been paid by the Americans. Reparations has been paid to every race except the African race. And therefore, in our commission, we have put forward a position which we are, is being placed before the parliament that we need to take action be both at the political level and CARICOM has in, in, a, in, a, in a way embraced the reparations. The, the CARICOM has come together as a group and the Caribbean countries are now going to make their demands by next year to the, the British government for reparation. We're not begging them. We can trace the ship liners. We can trace the monies. Some of it went to the Church of England. Some of it went to the British throne. It can be traced. The technology is there. We know the insurance companies who benefited from slavery. And therefore, our demand is just. There are other races who have been paid. And the Reparations Commission, under the teachings of Garvey, that we are, what we are due must be given to us. We have taken that as our challenge, and we're hoping that it's a long struggle. But one of the problems we had, because we are not educated enough on the ills of slavery. When we go in the communities, there's a feeling out there among some people, boy, we should just leave Europe alone. You know, make them go on with it. We must now focus on the present and the future because our people have not been educated. And Marcus spoke about the importance of our education and the self-development and self-reliance. So we are hoping that as we leave this, uh, this meeting today, we will continue to educate our children on the ills of slavery and the fact that we are poor, not because African people are lazy, but because the Europeans exploited us. It's that. All right. I also heard uh, my sister Sonia Harris uh, talked about some of the vexing issues that we have been looking at for the very longest time and asking ourselves, what does this mean for us? Africom, Northcom, Southcom, the CBSI. Um, how do we take control of our own, our own waters, our own borders? And uh, with especially now when we see a heightening of, of uh, the, the, the policies regarding Africom on the, on the continent of Africa, President Obama has presided over the militarization of Africa in such a way that it is shocking. We still praise him for whatever reason, but we have those issues to deal with. We have the issues of the Caribbean Basin Security Initiative, which we have not properly delved into. How can we talk about our own security when we do not even understand what it is that we have signed on to? Well or not, my, my, I have a sister who tells me that, listen, we're sold many times over already when it comes to security. Can you develop your point on AFRICOM? The CBSI, NORSCOM, what's happening with the borders, the boundaries, the, 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 the waters of Africa and the waters of the Caribbean and our own insecurity. Well, um, Sister Kambu, I must thank you for highlighting some of these issues right. over the last few years. Right. Because the issue, right. the, issue of, the issue of AFRICOM and the Caribbean Security Initiative have been first highlighted by you, to my knowledge. I think internally we are free. Internally we must claim our freedom. There's no one to ask for our freedom from. But externally, there is an external reality that we're not fully cognizant of. And you have done much with media to bring that to our attention. I think AFRICOM is a travesty, but at the same time, most of the African countries did resist having AFRICOM headquartered in their country. So they are aware of the potential threat from AFRICOM. But the creeping militarization of Africa is still happening. The same thing is happening in the Caribbean. The, sea, the Caribbean Basin Security Initiative appears to be concerned about our security. It is concerned about the security of America. All we need to understand is one thing. America looks after America's interests. Period. We, with our sense of freedom, that, in, that independence that we have as a people, let us move another step further and understand that we must look about our own interests. Our interests are our family, our community, our sense of ourselves as an African people worldwide, as a nation. 
we need to have at least that beginning understanding. It starts from the inside, not from the outside, but we must understand the external world as it tries to control and dominate us only to protect their own interests. It's a question of world domination. Muta, you had said earlier, thank you, Sonia. Muta, you had said earlier um, that culture is important when you're dealing with security and not just the singing and the dancing and the jumping and so on. And then before that, we heard earlier from Miguel Lauren, who talked about not letting the state off a hook. And I think it was also you who said that. I, I think it was um, Jerry Small who talked about not letting the state off a hook also um, when we looked at the socio-political issues. Um, against the background of all of that, what we're hearing of Africa and CBSI and so on, there's a lot that we do not know. Uh, we hear about education. We're talking about education here today also. How then do we go ahead or do, how do we move forward uh, with ensuring our own security, food security with genetically modified foods coming in and we have no idea what we're eating. We do have the right to know, but we don't. And military, the militarization of Jamaican waters. I mean, culture, what part, what, how can culture impact or affect that? Yeah, well, you know, um, when people talk about revolution more than they talk about gun to kill people and things, I will know that the greatest revolution is a cultural revolution where you define yourself in a space and don't allow others to define you. And if you leave your culture, obviously the next man's culture will fall. Because if it was buying from yourself, we would not buy from somebody else, therefore, them in a problem. What we find out is that in Jamaica, because most politicians in Jamaica, get educated through the same colonial system. It is very difficult for them to see and understand even where Rasta say. Yes. Because over the years Rasta talk about security. But because it's not security of guns and bombs, people are saying are living in some illusion, utopia. Now we say the, 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 the thing come right round to where Rasta did that say. Food, ganja, yes. spirituality, yes. music, all of the things that the Rasta was saying over the years is coming to fruition now. We need to push that more because the politicians them today done gone already. Them gone already. Them not going to help nothing. We have to push an agenda that is totally I want to say, I want to say against too. Because we are against what them want to do now with this IMF thing. The whole world understand that except them yeah. and then they know it before they become politicians yeah. because the same politician 30 years ago was talking about the youth them which is what me as i said before <laughs> they said what do you do for the youth them 30 years from now 30 years from now the same politician them are telling you what do you do for the youth them 30 years from now 2030. yeah so what is happening what is happening is that a regurgitation it is trying to it boils. It boils from you know. Yeah, it's a boil action. It's not something real. You, 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 you clear your boils through toilet business, and that's it. We need some kind of recognition of the people's culture, even though the people them look like them full fool, but it's not full fool and full fool enough. You know. It's not full fool and full fool. Right. And the same people them who are govern the system. It's the same people, them who did it before, of course, it's it's them. Thank you very much, Muta. Uh, Stephen, we are getting the wrap-up signal for this segment, but we want everybody to respond. And I know uh, Tekla wanted to make a point, so we go to Tekla. Yes. Very quickly, the biggest security is to know yourself. Why this black and African thing is not a light thing is that when you say black, the culture of black is corrupted with white. When you say African, it has a heritage, a culture, a logic of life. And I don't think we realize what we are meant for the world, as Marcus Garvey and his imperial majesty showed us. Please indulge me a minute. Here is what Garvey says in Negro World of 29. If the Negro thinks properly, he will realize that on him falls a serious responsibility and duty to salvage the bankrupt civilization of white Europe. This may sound ambitious, but after all, the Negro isn't here for fun. No. The biggest discredit to our culture is the thing they call entertainment, Amen. jumping up and down, because that is riches of our culture that Europe has helped us to trivialize. 
He has to survive centuries of hardships and difficulties just to die again. But to establish something more like the basis on which humanity should live than on which it should fight to die. You hear that? The responsibility of the Negro, as Garvey put it, and his majesty tells us all that Africa needs is within her. To be involved with this black and this other, all the Westminster model and this, we have it within us. We are of Mother Africa. It's a confidence to step and to see the logic, the philosophy of Africa, what it offers to all of us and to the world. All right, Brother Tekle Vekfet, and on that note, um, he's exactly right. We, we are fountains of ideas and we're motivated, but we still need the mechanisms, the organizational mechanisms to put these individual thoughts and inspirations into collective action, collective movement, and hence collective security. We want to thank all the panelists, Tekla McFett, Brother Clive Mohammed, um, Brother Patrick Beckford, Bert Samuels, attorney at law, Sister Sonia Harris, of course, journalist Muta Baruka, and of course, thanks for allowing me to co-host Kabul. You're quite welcome, Stephen. And uh, I'm sorry, we, 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 are, we are being told. I know that we, this segment was a bit abbreviated, and we do apologize for that. Uh, we're running against the clock, uh, but uh, we're moving into the next segment. Uh, immediately, you're inside of the Africa Forum, Running Africa. Can we take a quick break, and we'll be right back. Western Union, moving money for better. The time by Western Union is... I'm going to come over and give you a hug in a little while. Welcome back. Sister. Uh, we're coming to you live from Liberty Hall, the legacy of Mollimu Marcus Mazaya Garvey on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the founding of the UNIA and ACL. It is 100 years to the day, July 2019-14 to July 20-2014. This segment of the program... Uh, a gentleman who I consider a mentor. He was uh, very early in the day, uh, a, a guide to running African and has been so ever since. I've never called up anybody and said no, never, never. And we're very, very happy to have him with us in this segment. I'm talking about Professor Rupert Lewis, Garvey Scholar. He will be taking the final segment of the uh, symposium looking at the socio-economic status of the race. So it is over to Professor Lewis. Thank you very much, Andrew, and uh, thanks for your conceptualization and implementation of a discussion. This is what the Renewed Liberty Hall was set up to do. And I want to commend uh, Andrew as well as Donna McFarlane who has steered the ship of Liberty Hall from 2003 till now and raised the money necessary for the uh, facility that we now sit in. I am definitely biased towards the women. The men are, tend to be rhetoricians. They talk brilliant speeches but it's really the women who have made it possible to do things. And, I, I, and this, is, this, is, this is based on empirical evidence. It is Miss Elaine Melbourne, who in the 1990s saw this rundown building and put together a team to raise the money, rebuild it, and to request of the PJ Patterson administration of the day that uh, we had an obligation to restore what was a derelict site. Used to be, there's a man who lived here called Django who kept the building, kept his presence at the building. And uh, it was simply one of downtown Kingston's derelict buildings. I want to also say that I pay tribute to Amy Ashwood Garvey, one of the founding members of the UNIA. I pay tribute to Amy Jakes Garvey, one of the thinkers and doers. Garvey was both thinker and doer, but believe you me, Amy Jakes Garvey was an extraordinarily pract practical-minded person who got things done. So I want to encourage, you see the site next door at 78 King Street? All the people who are talking, I want them to help us to raise 60 million Jamaican dollars. 
to make that bill expand Liberty Hall to 78. I don't matter who owns it. I just want to know the team that can help us raise $60 million because I think we can do this uh, to expand Liberty Hall. And if you and I can do it, that's fine. I want to call on Stephen Golding to look at the gravesite of Amy Ashford Garvey in the Calvary Cemetery and see that a proper headstone is put for her. That's the job of the UNIA. So we need to pay tribute especially to our women who have been the bearers of the struggle and the practical implemented implementers of what needs to be done. I have a panel here of exceptionally gifted people, as have been all the panelists I've heard this morning. Uh, Dr. Erna Broadbaugh, founder of Black Space, novelist, sociologist. Uh, we have Aisley Henriquez, chairman of the Jamaica National Heritage Trust. We have Reverend Dr. Marjorie Lewis, President United Theological College of the West Indies. And we have Dr. Omar Davis, Minister of Transport, Works and Housing. And they will go in that order that I have indicated. Uh, so I want to call on Dr. Broadbaugh to go forward. Yes, the mic was off. You can hear me now, I'm sure. Okay then. So good morning. Good, very, very good morning to you all. I, I unfortunately was not here at the very beginning. So I missed some of the talk and I'm hoping that what I have to say does not therefore violate anything that anybody said. Uh, pardon me beforehand. But the impression I got from sitting and listening to other things was that we were tending to deal with the big, 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 big things. We're dealing with the um, with the, the, the macro things and I want to bring our attention now to the micro things because I sincerely believe that each one of us standing there, each one of here is a body and each body is capable of a revolution. We talk, I heard people talking about change, so the notion of change is all about that way. Change has to be, but we want to point out that change has to be, the revolution has to come from each one of us seeing the necessity for us to do something to make some sort of change, okay? I want also in this five minutes that I have just to put an image before you and then to shut up. I come from country, so I know about banana. And I know that you don't chop down banana, you wait for banana to shoot, and you don't force the, the sucker. They are there, you treat them. So I want us to think about that. When the change is coming, you don't have to knock down. You just take some time to nurture the sucker. All of us are suckers. Nurture the sucker and the change will come. Nurture the sucker. Each one of us here, nurture yourself. Are we talking about the economics this time? And we want you, everybody, you can make your own payday. Long time people used to prize themselves on and make my own payday. Try and see if you can make your own payday. One of the times I do a lot of work in the States, I sit down in North Carolina and I see the van coming in and I see black people taking the food off the van. I see black people serving the van. And I said to myself, if people had paid attention to Booker T. Washington and Marcus Garvey, we would not just be serving. The van would be ours. The food would be ours and so on. But it takes time. Please, it takes time. So as each individual outside there, consider your possibilities as an entrepreneur. Consider your possibilities as making your own payday. And we do as Marcus Garvey suggests, where you succeed, you'll help somebody else or you make a connection with that person and so on and so on and so on. And we link up and we link up and link up. And that is how we're going to get the big thing by linking up individuals. Thank you very much. Can I, Ainsley? Doc? Good morning, everybody. This is an extraordinarily wonderful anniversary occasion, 100th anniversary, and it's a very important time for all of us in Jamaica. It is a privilege to be here. I'm a little older than Rupert, and so I'm going to remind us and pay tribute to the late Woolly Maiden, the late Reverend Woolly Maiden, who before this building was restored, it was a derelict building, and he used to work 
towards keeping it tidy. So that alone was the beginning of its restoration, and I think we have to pay tribute to the late, late Reverend Woolly Menon. I'll also add that I was privileged to assist him in this program. Let me, let me repeat, which we have all heard and we all know very well, that as a people we have been dragged and shook here to form the nation of Jamaica. And in that sense, we are a very privileged people. We have so much togetherness, we have so much to be proud of, and this part of this exercise today is in fact to encourage that pride. National hero spoke clearly to emancipation. We are on the edge, verge of another emancipation, 180, or if you per, prefer 176 years later. Emancipation was granted to us. We fought, some of us fought for it, some of us died for it, but emancipation was granted. But emancipation, physical emancipation is one thing. Marcus Garvey spoke of emancipation from mental slavery. It is a concept which I think we still have not yet fully grasped. We emancipate ourselves more each day. As Dr. Bradford has indicated, it has to be something which we take individually as well as collectively and build ourselves out of enslavement. We are also been subjected to and still are to slavery of emancipate of economic domination we have to remove that we have to emancipate ourselves from that economic uh, 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 situation let me speak to briefly what my philosophy is we cannot change the past we can only provide a future we can only provide a vision for a future and we are here to talk about the economic activities that can encourage us to have a food future which is ours, not dominated by others as we have heard through the course of this morning. So it is up to us, up to us to use the word emancipation very clearly as to how we change our lives and how we develop our future and much of it is is going to come from our understanding of our past, understanding of our heritage, understanding of our contribution to the past, and this also has richness because it's not quite what we have inherited as the written history. Yes, yes, we can deal with that too. So these are issues which we are prepared to work with everybody to create a, a, a motto which is not just out of many people, but out of many cultures. We are one people out of many cultures. And in that sense, and in that sense, what we see in the future is using the various cultures of our ancestors, pick them up, work on them, and culture is not just music. It is our every aspect of how we each are. It is what food we eat, it is how we dress, it is how we walk, Every part of us is part of our culture, and we must recognize it, dig it up, and that will be where some, not all, some of our economic future and liberation and its emancipation comes from. And the National Heritage Trust is here to help you. Let me leave you with one other thought. On Wednesday in St. Thomas, we are celebrating the success of one of us in the parish of St. Thomas, Dr. Peter Nelson who went to St. Thomas schools and is now been offered and is accepting a, a postdoctoral fellowship in one of the premier scientific institutions in the world. Big up Dr. Peter Nelson. We need role models. Thank you very much, Mr. Enriquez. Okay, can I ask up, can we move to Dr. Omar Davis just to follow the sequence? <clears throat> thank you, thank you very much, Rupert. Thanks, Andrea, for inviting me. Good morning to everybody. And um, Andrea tells me that we are we are worldwide. Um, first of all, let me begin by saying that when I got the invitation, I started reflecting on the foresight and the vision of Marcus Garvey a hundred years ago, and it is almost unbelievable that someone 
with limited formal education could have had this vision and this understanding, deeper understanding of social, economic, and cultural issues a hundred years ago. Um, thoughts and visions which are remain relevant a century later. Uh, in listening to the discussion in the last in in, in, in the last panel, we have a, a definitional problem. There are different opinions whether we speak about African or black or Negroes. And I am guided by a musician who captured in music and in simple lyrics a lot of complex thoughts. Uh, Peter Tosh says, don't care where you come from. As long as you're a black man, you're an African. And I, that, that clarifies in my own mind exactly uh, what, in a sense, how we should approach this issue. Where are we a hundred years later? The reality is that although black people, Africans, have attained a great deal of political power, in some instances financial power. As a people worldwide, we have not. And in, we have not. And in trying to understand the reason, one of the, to me, the major issue is the absence of any guiding principle. Whilst attainment of financial power whilst attainment of political power are important in and of themselves it's not enough and we have seen in situations where a black man has attained the ultimate in terms of political power but the policies pursued are simply not any different from any, any other race attaining that power and that to me indicates the notion that pushing for ascendancy in the political space or the financial space is not enough. There has to be guiding principles, principles related to equity, principles related to the right of every human per being worldwide to certain basic needs. And that to me is where we have to look as we step forward in, in, this, in another century. The fact that, that people worldwide, human beings worldwide, and unfortunately, though the black people and African have suffered the greatest in that regard. There is a need for us to accept the need for each person worldwide to be accorded certain respect, to be accorded certain opportunities as human beings. Translating this, I think that's where Marcus Mosiah Gugave was heading when he formed the UNIA a hundred years ago. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Thank you, right. Dr. Let me, Davis. Let's let me move just, on to Reverend Dr. Marjorie Lewis. And let me just interrupt um, Dr. Lewis to say that we are up on a break, and we will take that break immediately after we've heard from the Reverend Dr. Marjorie Lewis. And uh, we're at 10 o'clock. Normally, the Big A would be up now with the Sunday sunshine, but we have an extra half an hour to 45 minutes uh, to continue this conversation. So we'll take the break immediately after we've heard from the Reverend Marjorie Lewis. Thank, thank you very much. Peace and blessings to all who are here and all of those listening to us in Jamaica and the World Wide Web. I approach this social and economic discussion from the perspective of the role of religion and the role of the academy or the university as somebody mentioned before. First point I want to raise is how we understand history. The concept of Sankofa for me is really important, that we return to pick up the wisdom from the past. But we return to pick up that wisdom from the past, not as an exercise in nostalgia, to talk about the greatness of African people in the past and the greatness of Garvey and his work. The challenge is 
Once we understand what has happened, what are we to do now? How do we receive the wisdom? This is Clive, a.k.a. Chris Zogo, you know. Well, you can give me a minute to make a talk to your listeners, then. Mm. Yeah, man, this, um, you're talking about the most listeners from Jamaica, U.S., Britain, and the world, you know. Especially the one, them, the like, YouTube and BOBS, a Roman channel. You know, if you over 20 years, Muta, I had, like, problems, they're going to get solution. But, you know, I feel black people, but Muta alone can do it alone, you know. But all we do, I think, listening, and we do we talk and we complain amongst ourselves. And part blame and I wish the government, white man, rich man, and Jack and Jesus to solve them. Black people, if you know, say, and a responsibility to other people solve them problem, you know. If you know, say, the man we have been put by his neck, now we take it off and let you lick it off and pump him in the face and stick in a thing short. Government is doing, government has done good, you know. Um, cause you, you see them a drive for Jira, and the regular artists, them are right, cause them don't make it. And I see them a pop champagne, flat BMW, and I be a big mansion, but, you know, they're not being a factory for the employee, you know. The problem that I face working and poor class don't affect them. I can't, well, I can't believe how cool it's going to be, you know. They're with the same people who cause the problem to fix it. We complain about foreigners, I buy up Jamaica, but instead, I we are buy up Jamaica, we buy up foreign goods. I don't know where the things say they get the money from. I see the money when you buy it, then goes then use back and come and come buy of Jamaica to use against you. The complain about Monsanto, but we shop at the supermarket all the time. And we don't even try to create our own supermarket that we sell our own organic food. So we leave it up to them to solve our problem with them create. Marcus Gavi said, if you can't do what other races do, you know, you deserve to die. And that is exactly what happened to me right now. If you can't own the whole sale like the Chinaman, you don't deserve to stay poor and jobless. If you can't own the multinational like the white man, you don't stay at the bottom of the political and economic system and big IMF. If you can't own the big farm like Monsanto, you don't deserve to die from cancer and dead of famine. Muta give you enough solution to your problem. But Muta, I, you alone can't don't have the money to solve a big problem, yeah? But so if we put the money together, we can create the big man, big corporation, a big business that will represent our interests and agenda to work to solve our problem. I say, me don't say already, you know, if a thousand a motor listener put a thousand US dollars, that's a million US, hundred million Jamaica can set a foundation, start a business. We are going to invest in billion and expanding black business like farm, supermarket, car creators, transportation, etc., etc which will provide wealth and jobs amongst our own by ourselves. Talking and complaining is good, you know, because I like the problem. But it's time to rebuild business and structure to solve the problem that we complain about so much. Every race have them structures set up. That is why you can see Chinese come from China, set up shop, and stack it out with all Chinese meal. All of that one knows to do is just be a buyer. You can't even blame the Chinese, you know, because they're not doing it for yourself anyways. My solution, I know the be all and all, but it's one thing that is in your power to do and can create a system that will outlast us all alive now, you know. Muta is the only man in Jamaica I feel that is trustworthy. That is why I'm willing to invest a thousand US in a him to set up a business to build our system. There must be at least, you know, a thousand happy listeners who believe in real self-reliance. If not, I guess. Black Jamaican is doomed to want to be bigger. One thousand dollar, I don't know, you know, cause why? You see, no, Jamaican spend more than that for ganja, liquor, bleaching cream, clothes and care and big old etc. In over consumption. If you don't have a thousand, then you know what? Can't get ten people to join you at one then. So we want all the serious motor listeners them to email motor, motor, I rate them that next. I call up and tell him, say, oh, you're ready to invest in IMF bill. He phone a system. So that me want to the people on the motor. Blessed man, give thanks. That's so serious. That's so very, very serious. Very serious.